when did your something is very wrong here gut instinct turn out to be right. I've always been prone to gut feelings, but my mom's takes the cake. She went to a boarding school and ended up leaving her senior year, but her two best friends still went there. They all lived in similar areas for summer and my mom wanted to go back and see everyone towards the end of summer break when she was 17. All three girls, including my mom, were going to take a train to a nearby station and meet up there and take a taxi to the school. My mom got to our home train station and got hysterical, which she never does, and told her mom she has a horrible feeling and doesn't want to go. Her mom told her to absolutely not go, and they went home. Later on that night, they got a call that the two girls who went were in a car accident with a drunk taxi driver on the way to the school. My mom's most best friend in the world was thrown from the car and decapitated. The other girl was so severely injured that she was more or less a vegetable and paralyzed from the neck down. She lived about another decade unable to speak or move and then passed away in a home. My mom has been through the ringer in life but this has always made her tell me to always follow my gut feeling. She said she never had a gut feeling when she was a teen and this was the only time she ever did. She was looking forward to this trip for months, but that feeling was enough to make her back out right when she was boarding the train. My mom is so strong, and I'm not sure why this happened, but I'm thankful for whatever power allowed my mother to be okay. Not my gut instinct, but my friends. When I was 16 I was chilling with my friend, both really small for our age, 157 centimeters, on a playground beside a road. That road wasn't too busy, but every once in a while a car drives by point my friend and I were just talking about random stuff when we noticed a car driving by. It was an old car and the engine made a quite unique sound and we were laughing about it. A few minutes later that same car drives by again. My friend tells me it's weird and that we should leave. It was already dark at this point. I just told her to stop being paranoid but agreed to turn off my phone so in case he came by again he wouldn't be able to see my phone light up point sure enough he drove by again and my friend went on the ground hoping he wouldn't see us. I was getting suspicious at that point and went down with her. We agreed to leave, got up and started walking towards the road to get home as the car pulls up behind us, drives by us, and parks right in front of us. We see the door opening and start running. At this point I still thought it was ridiculous to run away. At the end of the road I turn around to look, and the guy has now gotten back into his car and is driving in our direction. Lucky us there was a road that was currently in maintenance and cars couldn't pass through, so I grabbed my friend's hand and rushed through it. The car got slower at the intersection, but then drove off point I'm really glad my friend was this suspicious, because god knows what would have happened to us had we stayed at that playground. I was in third grade and my little sister in second, and we were walking from the bus stop to our house. I remember the walk wasn't too long, but my dad wasn't there waiting for us, and he usually was, especially because it was raining point. So I grab my sister's hand and we start walking in a giant group of kids that starts to dwindle off the further we get into the neighborhood. Well this car pulls up, and this man stick his head out, and says my name and my sister's name point I got really freaked out, and he says my dad told him to get us, and take us home cause he was worried about the rain point I instantly get terrified, and I get the worst gut feeling ever. 1. Cause my dad would never send someone to get us in 2. We'd have known beforehand point, so I say no and this man insists on us getting into the car. So I ask him what the password is my parents always gave us a password to follow if they sent someone or something was supposed to happen. Like if we were answering the door we'd ask what the password was and they would say blueberry. Well this man looks at me and laughs really weirdly and says our password. Which is faking weird because it was in Arabic and this man was obviously not Arab in any way. Plus he's said it's so wrong. He starts to try to usher us into the car and tell us how we could get sick from the rain and stuff. I immediately start screaming and I guess the high school bus has just let out and this faking huge teenage just starts screaming at this man and another teenager's pulling me and my sisters down the street and telling us she'll take us home. 
At that exact moment my mom is walking down the street with an umbrella and the man is gone point I told my dad about this guy and I guess the prison my dad worked at one of the inmates had essentially put a hit out on my dad and they thought to kidnap us still no idea how the fact he knew what the password was but yay. Terrifying. I can only image what would have happened if we'd just gotten into the car. When I was dating my wife, she used to call me at pretty predictable times. Sometimes we wouldn't talk to each other until like 6pm at the latest, and we didn't ever text each other. We were young, and in love and call it phone chicken now, as we would both wait, as long as possible, before calling one another. We didn't want to seem too eager, but one of us would always fold and call around the same time, and we also didn't want to be a couple who constantly texted each other. So, she was a bit sick one Friday night but nothing too serious to us, just a little cough, so we didn't think much of it. She stayed with me and was going to visit her parents a couple hours away the next morning for the weekend point I didn't hear from her since I left for work and just thought she was busy with her family at first. Turns out in chemical lab the day before, we were still in college, she had inhaled some other or ammonia or something they were working with and this gave her chemical pneumonia point she woke up the next day, while at her parents barely breathing, and with a plethora of other complications. It was really bad, dangerously close to total respiratory failure. At this point I did not know anything yet. Not to mention, if she was not visiting her family I would have been at work, and not there to help her. So I did not hear from her early on that day and she usually did call early from her parents as she was usually quite bored there. What was strange was it wasn't the normal I wonder why I haven't heard from her. That would cross my mind on day she was busy point I felt like I knew something horrible had happened and decided to call her parents house around 3pm. I did not normally do this as we were just dating a little over a year and didn't feel that comfortable with them yet as well as respected their private time with their daughter. They didn't answer, and her phone was still off. It died as I was talking to her the night before. This is when my gut really kicked into high gear. I knew something happened point I did finally heard from her at around 9pm after a few gut twisting hours of talking to her friends to try and find out what was going on and getting no answers. Needless to say I immediately went over to the hospital she was rushed to to comfort her. She was actually genuinely pissed I wasn't at the hospital with her sooner, and that I wasn't able to find out she was there, even though there was no way I could have found out as no one else knew, and I would have had to call the hospitals, I actually did consider doing this, or she would have had to contact me, but was being examined the whole time, and didn't have her phone, she was also fairly drugged still. We joke about this now, but the grim truth is she could have died, if she wasn't visiting her parents. This will be kinda long, so sorry and I apologize for any grammar or spelling mistakes. English is not my first language. Also, for context, I'm a girl point in my country. Schools have at least two turns. One in the morning, one in the afternoon, and so my freshman year of high school I was in the afternoon turn. I made some great friends there, but in the end I had to change to the morning turn. Because of family reasons. However, Quite oftenly I would stay until the afternoon turn started to say hi to my friends and to spend time with them, my two best friends, let's call them E and C, made more friends in their classes and I would interact with these new friends. Sometimes we all go out to the nearby park or to play to the arcade, but there was this kid that I never really liked, he was just odd, something about him creeped me, so I tried not to spend a lot of time with him, yet, there is a group picture where we both are together anyways. Flash forward 4 years, E, C and I are in our last year of college. I haven't seen any of them in some time, and the news started reporting on how this odd kid's father was killed rather close to the high school we all went to. At the moment the news reported the reason he was killed was because of a robbery that went sour. But I thought it was weird, he was stabbed in front of his son several times. Why would you stab a man? So many times, if you didn't know him, my dad worked at the same industry as the now dead father of the odd guy, and saw his wife the following week. He says she was really shocked and sad. Few days later the wife is also dead. Apparently she had committed suicide. She hadn't it had been staged to look like one point the will executor was also a friend of my dad. She told us that when they found this odd guy's mom they took her to the hospital. The guy was playing in the waiting room. 
with his girlfriend, laughing, and not showing even an ounce of worry for his mom. Point it turned out that the odd guy and his girlfriend were the culprits. They hired some relatives of the girl and killed them because they wanted the money his parents had. They were kinda big on their industry point what is worse is that C and E had gone the weekend prior to the first murder to the countryside with both of them and they started talking about what would they do to get away with murder and it was the same plan they used in the end. Also the same day the mother was killed they called C to give them a ride. C got a weird feeling and declined saying he was in the laboratory and didn't know when he would be leaving. So now C is sure that they were plotting to kill him too to run away with his car edit 1. I'm sorry for not leaving this clear. Odd guy and girlfriend are now in jail. They were found guilty. Also the girl relatives who committed the crime are now in jail. I'm not comfortable saying where this took place since I'm not sure C would approve of me telling his suspicions. But it was not in the USA. It was in a third world country and we were all surprised that police did their work. Point thanks for all the karma and upvotes and to the kind redditor who gave this post silver. I met a nice gentleman on a vacation I decided to take once. I stayed within the United States. He was witty, charming and just an overall nice guy. You wouldn't have suspected anything was wrong with the situation from a bird's eye view. We didn't have a sexual relationship, but it was defiantly a romantic one. Eventually we traded contact information and parted ways fast forward to end of the vacation and I decide to take a bold move and message him first. He responded in a friendly way and we end up messaging each other back and forth for about 6 months. We get to know each other on a more personal level. At that point it was an online relationship, but I had already met him in real life and knew that he was a real person, so I didn't assume that I was doing anything dangerous at one point I asked him if I could visit him in his home state. We were both from the US. He agreed, and we worked out the logistics of me coming to visit him. Everything seemed to be going well, and I was very excited to see him again. Point according to this man's social media, he was not in an exclusive relationship with anyone. This proved to be true with the flirty banter he had been exchanging with me for the past few months. However, there was one particular female about his age and with a different last name who would frequently comment on his pictures and status. She would not comment in a flirty or romantic way, but she was always there. Point I assumed that she might be his cousin or even a platonic friend, so I decided to ask him about this woman. He informed me that they were platonic friends and that he was looking forward to my visit point this is the part where I started to feel something was very wrong. I don't know why I felt that. I felt like something wasn't right despite the fact that on the surface everything seemed fine. I could not shake the emotion. I had to do something point I decided to do something particularly bold and stupid although looking back I do not regret my decision. I decided to send his friend a message and introduce myself. I figured that if they were friends, then she would be thrilled to find out her friend had a romantic interest. Point it didn't take long for me to figure out that not only was this man in an exclusive relationship with this woman, but that this was his CNK and they were planning on getting married in approximately 3 to 4 weeks from that time. She had no idea who I was. Nor did she know that her fiancé K was communicating with a random woman that he had met on a trip he had taken. We immediately ceased contact point the best part about this story is even after I halted contact with the groom, he continued to send me messages until the day of his wedding. I did not respond to any of the messages that he sent. I also did not take that trip. As far as I know, to this day the couple is happily married. I'm not sure what kind of story he told his wife in case she ever decided to ask him about what in the world I was doing in the crux of their relationship. I suppose we will never know point at it. Thank you so much to everyone for all of the upvotes and comments. Y'all are awesome. When I was in college I sold weed slash pills slash mall. Lie whatever I could get my hands on that would make me money, but nothing too hard, but still enough to get me multiple felonies if I ever got caught. One day while sitting stoned with some friends, I got this weird feeling and just said all this sheet has to go I spent the rest of the day removing all paraphernalia, had 20 plus pieces of glass, posters showing off my favorite hobby on every square inch of the wall, scales, bag is dope etc.etc. 
cleaned the place top to bottom, even vacuumed the entire apartment with a dust buster because my roommate broke my vacuum. Less than 48 hours later I'm sitting with one of the same friends and hear a loud, hard fast knock. My friend jokes who tf is knocking like the police, the answer, the police. I had 8 officers in my apartment stating that they were doing a wellness check and were demanding entry to our rooms. I was living on campus and the way it worked is cops had access to the living area, but anything beyond the living room, i.e. our personal room slash bathrooms, required a consent form. Point I go around to my other roommates and let them know the cops are there. Roommate 1 said no problem and went to the living room. Roommate 2 was with a friend and about to light up a bowl. Roommate 3's door was locked and did not answer. After about 10 minutes of small talking with the police and Loki freaking out knowing they are there for me, roommate 2 is still not out. Cops asked me to see what they were doing, so I opened the door and my roommate had been smoking the whole time. I whisper yell what the fuck are you doing the cops are here and slammed the door going oh shit my bad guys and told the cops they were faking and needed a minute. Well roommate 2 comes out with a cloud behind him and they probable cause his ass and are tearing his room apart. Fast forward 2 hours and they have destroyed his room and all they found was a couple seeds. Not enough to test and determine it was cannabis funny part is after this happened. The cops asked me to step outside and told me about the dangers of the company you keep and that I'm liable for anything my roommates are doing and should be careful of their hobbies because they were there because someone had told them someone was dealing drugs out of the apartment. So I don't know if this counts, but this was fairly recently, I had a feeling of back quote something bad is going to happen, while driving about 2 months ago, heading into the city from my parents house. It was a little rainy, and I had just come to a stop on the interstate, because traffic was backed up going into the city. Because of that feeling I looked back, to check on my dog who was in the back seat, and then up at my rear view mirror, just in time to see a truck hurdling towards my Prius, and I had just enough time to think, back quote surely, he's going to stop, and then, back quote oh holy shit he's not back quote and then wham. He sandwiches me into the car in front of me along with the side of the bridge we were on. I actually dropped my hand off the steering wheel, to prepare for impact just in time. To prevent my thumb from being snapped the fuck off, I had it resting casually on the bottom of the steering wheel. I saw a video of this truck literally demolishing another car on the interstate the other day, and I saw it, and almost threw up, because that could have been me, and my baby girl, my dog. The woman died on impact. I still think about if I hadn't moved my hand, or if he had been going any faster, how he cold killed my dog and I. Scary as faking sheet point also. For bonus points, before I left that day, my mother and I had a conversation point mom, you know, your next car should be a truck. Me, no mama, I want a challenger, I got the Prius, to save money on gas and I've always wanted one, so I'm getting one, watch me. Mom, no you need a big truck so nothing's gonna hurt you on the road. Me, we'll see, maybe a truck wouldn't be so bad, some of them are kind of cool looking point boom. Car accident. In case you're wondering, I ended up buying another Prius. A friend of mine from high school had a hard time of it when he went to university, didn't really get along with many of his codes, had a crush on a girl that was dating one of his other friends at the time, and he had a family history of depression. Eventually, he had a mental breakdown and was diagnosed with depression as well. He spent a few weeks in hospital to get treatment and came back home seemingly feeling much better two weeks after he's released from hospital. He tells me he would like to take a week's break from university and would like to come visit me. I agreed. We made plans. I was supposed to pick him up from the train station on a Saturday. I was studying in a different town. Anyways, that Saturday comes around, and as I'm about to walk out the door and head for the train station, I get a text from him saying that he isn't feeling well, and that he's gone back to hospital. I try and call him, get no response. I send him a text with some type of I hope you get well soon, and then decide that I have a really bad feeling about this for some reason. Well, this was more logic than a gut feeling, plus I've had depressions, and felt suicidal myself. So I was worried. Thing is, 
he never wanted us to visit in hospital, was adamant that we not see him that down, so I didn't know which hospital. I rang a different friend, got the number for his parents, rang his parents, and found out they didn't know anything about him going back for more treatment, but was told at which hospital he'd been. Rang the hospital, got told that they couldn't give out confidential patient information which apparently includes whether a certain person is a patient there. Told the person on the phone that I didn't need to know but that if my friend wasn't there, they needed to call the police and why. Wasn't entirely sure that the hospital caller had taken me seriously, so I called the police myself, explained the situation point found out the next day that he'd committed suicide by jumping off a bridge. The police did take me seriously, don't know if the hospital did, and sent someone to check both the hospital and his place, and on not finding him in either location, put out a call for a general search. They didn't find him in time. We were on a road trip point driving on a provincial road. My dad was driving, younger brother in the front seat. Me and my mum in the second row seats we were about to turn into a small, gravel, access road. There were three guys and two motorcycles in that access road. Near the intersection one guy was facing out of the access road, towards the provincial road. The other two were facing in. They were in the middle of the way and they were seemingly talking to each other point my dad was about to honk when I thought something's wrong and noticed that the guy in the back seat of the motorcycle facing into the access road put his hand inside his jacket. I immediately shouted dad leave. Now as loud as I can. A second later we heard 9 shots. I saw it happening right in front of us. That one guy is dead point as it was a fairly quiet area we left as quick as possible in fear of being hunted down for being witnesses. The shooters were right on our tail for a good 7 minutes. They turned somewhere before we were nearing a populated town point I still remember the appearance of the shooters and how it happened. I wasn't traumatized by it but my dad, mum and brother all were. We let some air out for a while and decided not to reveal what happened. The elections in the nearby town were near, and we feared the shooting was due to politics, and decided it's best to stay out of it points due to shock. My dad didn't want to drive. I had to drive for the rest of the trip. I have a license. After two hours we returned to the area. Body has been retrieved by the police. There were other witnesses, and they were put into witness protection. We went to where we needed to go. Then left. We don't know if they memorized our car's plate number. And we recently bought a firearm for protection just in case point edit. It was later confirmed to be related to politics by the local police department. At my workplace, employees are constantly coming and going. And we have new employees all the time. Managers are also transferring to and from our location quite often. Most employees are very young, even the managers, usually between the ages of 18 to 25. One day, we had a newly promoted manager begin working at a location, which wasn't anything new. Coincidentally, his brother had already begun working at a location as well, so they were able to work together. The new manager was fairly young and nice looking. He was one of the friendliest people I have ever met and very engaging when he introduced himself to everyone. Everyone thought he was very nice and I agreed that he was friendly. But from the moment I first shook his hand and looked him in the eye, my gut told me something was off. For some reason, I felt an extreme lack of trust in him and I couldn't figure out why. He was very nice, maintained eye contact, and had a nice smile. I couldn't understand why no one else got the heebie-jeebies from him and I myself couldn't figure out why I felt this way. I continued to see him at work often and I continued to get weird unexplainable vibes. I saw him often, and he was at a location for quite a while. After a few months of being around him, I told myself that my gut was wrong, and I tried to shake off the vibes I initially had. He just seemed so nice point well, I should have trusted my gut. I took some time off work to go on a trip, and found out during my absence that he had been fired. Turns out he beat the tar out of his much smaller brother, fracturing the brother's arm in the process. Never will I dismiss my gut feeling again. I'm not sure if it's considered a gut instinct, since my stomach ends up hurting a ton when situations like these occur. 
However, I know what it is, because the pain has a distinct feeling to it, but anyways I was probably around 11 to 12 when this happened. It was a Friday, and I had karate lessons with my siblings and my mum was the one who took us to our lesson at the local community center. On the way there, we noticed my uncle shopping at this small grocery shop. We said our greetings and we were off on our way again. Point we arrived a couple minutes before our lesson started and everything was peachy. Class started and about 20 to 30 minutes in, my stomach started hurting. At first, I just ignored it, but the feeling grew more intense. I had no choice but to go to the restroom, rinse my face with cold water, and take a couple of deep breaths. Except I knew it won't go away, no matter what I did, so I just head over to where my mum was sitting, and asked her to call home point she just looked at me, as though I was going crazy, because of how adamant I was in having her call. She got fed up after a few pleas and she went ahead, and used the front desk phone, and called my father. He picked up, said everything was fine, and that our uncle and his family came by for a visit. My mum told me that, thinking that I would finally stop pestering her, but the pain got worse. I tried encouraging my mum to call again about 20 minutes later, crying at this point point my mum called again but nobody answered. She tried two more times and still, there was nothing. My mum told me to just sit with her as there was a few minutes left of our class and we'll go back home, as soon as it's over. True to her word, we did which was surprising, because she normally would stay a while talking to the other moms, but I guess, because of how much I stressed, that we had to go home, she listened point, when we got back to our building, our floor's carpets were soft and wet. We turned around the corner and nothing seemed out of the ordinary except for the slight smoky smell in the carpet. I'm pretty sure my heart was not the only one that sank when we got closer and realized where the source of the smoky smell was coming from. My mum opened the door to our apartment as it was left slightly ajar and it was not pretty. I passed out at that point because of the shock but later found out that our wonderful neighbors popped their heads out of their own apartment in time to see me just fall over and they brought my mum, my siblings and myself to their suite and they explained what went on and how most of my relatives were transported to the hospital but only because of just smoke inhalation, other than that everyone was okay point we later found out after we got everything sorted out and everyone was well enough that our stove turned on by itself, a problem we've had for a few weeks and were waiting for a new stove and my father who was distracted with the guests, forgot to take his pan of oil off the stove. The oil had overheated, causing it to explode, in which the impact had caused a pipe in our kitchen to burst as well. My father said if my mum did not call the first time, that I urged her to, as it made him leave the suite, so he could hear her properly, they wouldn't have left the apartment as fast as they could. Only because when my dad went back in, he forgot to close the door properly behind him. Point I also had the same feeling before his appendix burst, so that was fun too. I grew up in North Idaho. It's a very beautiful place, but used to be very remote so a lot of people would move there to get away from society and the government. Just for context, Ruby Ridge took place there. Point as a kid, I wanted to join 4-H. I signed up and was sent to local chapter. I got to the first meeting and it was very strange. I was the only person there besides the family who hosted the chapter which was really just their kids. The house was dank and dark. The kids were homeschooled and lacked social skills. I was told the father was ill and in a back room. I never saw him. There were several weird comments. It all just felt a little off. I quit 4-H shortly after over the years we hear weird rumors. Like their dogs breeding with coyotes for so long a pack of two dozen coyote dog crosses were outside their house and would attack anyone who came close like their neighbors or the mailman. Strange letters about witches and government conspiracies were sent to neighbors. And most concerning, for years no one saw the younger children point it took about 10 years, but everything finally unraveled. After turns out the mother suffered from mental illness and the family lived in poverty completely off the grid. The children subsisted mainly on lily pads and pond water, the house was filled with garbage. The oldest daughter was primarily responsible for homeschooling the children and caring for her youngest sister. She left home to join the military, but was medically discharged due to complications of long-term malnourishment. Then, in 2001, 
The father died of malnourishment after a long struggle with multiple sclerosis. These events prompted the oldest daughter to report the family. When authorities arrived to remove the children, a five-day standoff ensued. Point the kids hold themselves up in their home for five days, while the county sheriff's department waited outside. The sheriff did not force their way in, because one they were kids, and two they were armed. During the standoff, they had dropped off parcels of food and water. Envoys familiar to the children approached the house and were able to make contact point the whole situation was chaos. In addition to the county sheriff the area was swarming with news crews. Anti-government groups would travel to the area to offer moral support to the children yesterday and point out the dangers of cooperating with the government. At one point the kids were close to surrender but a television helicopter had hovered by the house, scaring them so much that nothing was heard from the kids for several more days. Finally, the kid surrendered point my gut told me something was off. As a kid, I didn't know enough to report it, but I would like to think I would as an adult if I encounter red flags again. I was probably about 10 or 12 years old when my mom asked me if I wanted to go into town and help her with something and later we'd go and get some lunch. So I went because I wanted lunch. A friend of my mom's who I'll call Ken, was an owner of a pawn shop in a busy part of town. Ken was out of town on vacation for a week when he found out from one of the managers that the store was running low on cash and in order to stay open for the rest of Ken's vacation, they needed money and they needed it now. So Ken called up my mom and told her to the bank and withdraw a couple thousand dollars and drop it off at the pawn shop for the working manager so they could keep the store running and Ken would pay her back in full. So my mom got a couple thousand dollars out of her account, and we drove to the pawn shop. The manager that was supposed to be there, to pick up the cash wasn't there. So we called the manager, and she told us she'd be at the store in 20 meters 45 meters later she shows up with four very sketchy looking black guys, not trying to be racist. The manager opened up the store and my mom very sternly told the four black guys to stay outside, while she gave the money to the manager inside. She brought me in, and I just sat in the main room, while the two sorted things out in a back room. The four black guys, who were outside the store, start banging on the locked door asking to come inside. Something told me don't open the door, don't let them in, so I just told them to wait until the manager could let them in 15 meters pass, while they're in the back room and the guys are still asking to come in. Finally my mom comes out and tells me to hurry up and get in the car. We are leaving. My mom opens the outside door to the store. We get in the truck. The four black guys enter the store and we leave. Two weeks later we find out that the female manager and all four black guys were arrested for stealing all of the money from the store and all the items and brutally attacking Ken. I never realized this until much later, but had I opened the door for those four guys, me and my mom would probably be dead. Woke up around 8pm still feeling exhausted from my previous shift, I work graveyard shifts. Had this really bad feeling that something bad is going to happen to my unborn child and wife who's at work, also works graveyard shift, so I decided to fight off the sleepiness and watch TV while texting her. We had the usual conversation and I know, if she doesn't respond, she's busy so for an hour or so, I was fine without getting a reply when suddenly I got a call from her team leader asking me to get to the hospital ASAP, because she was bleeding, and is going on labor at 32 weeks. When I got there her condition has improved a bit, and was just gonna be under observation, to make sure her blood pressure, doesn't spike again, before they issue a discharge notice, and after 12 hours we finally got to relax, so I decided to head outside for a minute and light a cigarette. Suddenly I'm getting another call this time from a nurse asking to get back in the IQ I thought they were just going to give me some discharge instructions, but was surprised to find out they've taken her to the surgery slash delivery room and did not wait for me anymore. Something about doctor's call point after another 30 minutes, ob came out, showing me the placenta has already turned almost completely black, and I learned about preeclampsia that day point good thing as we were lucky, that day and the doctor and nurses were really good, because it seems not many mothers or babies survive that, and the only thing we had to worry, was the very high hospital bill which I thought, was incomparable to what I, got in exchange. 
About 10 years ago, I'm pretty sure I was nearly abducted. I was not a child, but around 30 years of age, at the time. I was quite sure of myself, and streetwise, and had lived in plenty of rough areas. I used confidence. It did not help point it happened, while was walking through a fairly suburban area near my family's home, which I was visiting. It was the middle of the day, which in retrospect, is a prime time, to pull something like this, since no one is normally home. A man pulled up, and asked for directions. He looked like a normal dad in a normal middle class car. He was holding out a piece of paper with something scribbled on it, so I leaned in to look, something about it just felt off though, even though he seemed nice, and looked very clean cut. He held the paper just a bit out of my reach, sort of luring me into the car, but very subtly and then, at the last moment, he tried to grab me. I pulled back, and said something like, what the fuck? And he sped off point later, I realized that the piece of paper couldn't possibly have contained an address, since there were no numbers on it. I had to get very close, to see that and by then, he was already lunging at me. I'm convinced to this day he was a bona fide psychopath, the kind that makes women go missing in broad daylight, when they've just popped out to the shops. Most of those types are described as normal, nice guys by their neighbors and other witnesses, once they are caught, but most never are caught. I think this was why I got an odd feeling about him. If it weren't for that feeling, I'd have been caught completely off guard, and who tf knows where I'd be right now. Point moral of the story is, never be caught off guard if you're a woman. All those guys who go around spreading the not allman hashtag will never change our minds, as long as people like this exist. This was one of those situations that reminded me that even as grown-ups, women are never really safe point trust your instincts, people. To quote a character from Bojack Horseman, when you look at someone through rose-colored glasses, all the red flags just look like flags, I got home from work late one night. I had two dogs at the time, an elderly Boston Terrier and my service hound, who was around one at the time, and who I had begrudgingly left at home instead of bringing with me. Only the Terrier greeted me at the door, which was extremely unusual. This is when I instantly knew something was wrong. My ex was already in bed. I had to flip on lights and go look for the hound, who I found bleary eyed and confused looking on the couch, but she was happy to see me once she realized who I was. Upon petting her, I noticed something crusty on the back of her head. It was dried blood. I immediately woke my ex and grilled him about why she was bloody. He denied any knowledge and went back to bed as I cleaned my poor dog up. It was quite obvious she was concussed. I checked every single sharp edge in the house, anything that cold fallen off the wall, table, or counter, anything heavy that could be lifted and subsequently dropped. I found nothing. No blood evidence, anywhere. I still don't know what the object used to hurt her was all I know, is that my ex beat my service dog so badly, that she sustained a concussion, and that he hid the evidence well enough for me, to not find it. Within a few weeks after that, he held a gun to my forehead. Stupid me didn't leave him, because I'd have had nowhere else to go. A few weeks after that, he tried breaking my hound's neck. And he strangled me half to death point coming up on two years after the fact. We both are alive and healthy. We both have some significant PTSD from the ordeal of living with him. I have to wake her up 8 to 10 times a night from her nightmares and I insta panic. If something touches my neck. But physically we are fine. Eventually. He will be going to prison for around 5 years the little scar on the back of her head haunts me. And and is a daily reminder. To be very careful about who you trust. I want to be nice to everyone. This really screwed me over when I was in the 4th grade. We had a physical education, pet, teacher named Mr. Walsh. He didn't seem, right. I pushed past it, since I was an outcast, and wanted to give everyone a chance, even if they were an adult, and wouldn't logically be my friend point he had this way, for context, of being weird. Most teachers, to look at a kid, tilt their head down a bit, to make direct eye contact where Walsh would keep his head up and just look at you with his eyes. He had a small smile. He wouldn't smile with his teeth, and it would just be tiny tilt of the corners of his mouth. He wouldn't smile with his eyes, because he barely used any of his facial muscles. Because he looked down at you in that special way, his eyelids would look close, so he only looked through slits. 
He wore glasses so it usually covered up the fact that he was looking you up and down. During lunch he would always walk behind the female students and look down at them on that creepy way with that smile. Another things about that, whenever he looked at a student, he smiled at them. So got him creepy point one day he helped me do gymnastics. For context, I was a pretty girl. I don't mean to be vain, but I do look pretty decent. A solid 7 or 8. I was scared the whole time, because I've never been flexible. There was this foam circle thing, and I put my back against it, stretched my hands and feet up and down, and rolled over in a backflip. The entire time he was touching my body, to make sure I was safe. Safe my ass. I didn't want it, and I screamed the whole time, but he just guided my body along, placing his hands on my legs and chest F. I didn't think anything out point then I found out years later he had to leave the school, because he was a beedo, and ended up fired. There was nothing I could do, so by the time I has my realization about the touching, I said nothing to an adult. I still don't, because there really is nothing I can do. I tell the story as an anecdote to my friends and a warning to young girls, to make sure what is happening is okay point seriously, stay safe and be wary. I live in a small town in Germany, where the population is mostly old people, so it was very likely that some elder asked for help, taking groceries to their car or watch out for their dog, etc. One day, my best friend and me were on our way home from being outside meeting friends. We always took a shortcut up a steep hill, where this old farmer's house with a bar next to it was. That house always gave us a sketchy feeling when we walked past it, but we never actually saw someone go outside of the house or inside. But that day an old lady came out and asked us if we could help her carry her couch inside and me and my friend looked at each other, being a bit skeptical, and agreed. When we lifted the couch, on our way to the back door of the house, I felt that something was very very wrong. I looked at my friend and whispered dude let's please leave, something's not right. So we let the couch drop and I faked that I tore something in my back, apologized for it, and then left. Turns out that the same old lady baited two other kids, just a bit older than we were at that time. With the same method into her house two weeks later. Both of these kids were shot in the back of the head with a gun, I don't know which kind of gun. Until today this haunts me, because me and my best friend Cold died that day, when we was on our way home. I'm glad my alarm went off, and I still pray for the families of these two kids. We never actually went by that house again, even though that event took place about 9 years ago from now on. Side note, we were 13 and 12 at the time this happened. My then pregnant wife was complaining of severe constipation. She just couldn't pass a stool point I didn't think this was right, it really didn't seem right at all, and in my gut I felt something else was far far wrong. She never has issues going to the toilet. She was writhing around in such pain. 11.10 she said it was after an hour of this, her body temperature rose, and she had diarrhea, so no, she wasn't constipated. Her body temperature dropped, and she felt better then came the blood point then came the 14 week and 5 day old little person that was growing inside her that we had seen, that day moving about. Alive and well on an emergency ultrasound scan following a bout of heavy bleeding the previous day point I knew something was wrong, I just knew it. When I took her to the hospital the day, before I felt it wasn't right. It was just too much. But it stopped, and the scan showed everything was okay, but something in my gut didn't seem right because my wife was complaining of not feeling right. If everything is okay why was she in discomfort, and why did that discomfort get worse and worse? This was 3 weeks ago now. I'm still so so, so sad point edit, I'm gonna keep adding to this, just as my kind of sounding board, so I have somewhere to write things down. I spoke with a bereavement midwife the other day, in the UK, following a miscarriage, you get a bereavement midwife appointed to you who helps you through the next stages. Our baby was taken away for tests to one of the leading UK children's hospitals at our agreement, and is now back at the hospital, where my wife was looked after during pregnancy, and through the miscarriage. I'm expecting a phone call from the hospital chaplain today, we'll discuss having a little cremation service. My wife and I will take away the ashes, their option was to scatter them at a place my wife and I don't like. I thought I might take the ashes to where I grew up, by the sea. 
The baby was due to be born in November, and I had this wonderful ongoing daydream where on my next birthday next May, me, my wife and my daughter slash son would all go to the beach where I used to go when I was a child and we'd have a picnic and watch the seagulls and listen to the sea lapping against the shore. For the service itself, I won't wear too much black, I want to buy a nice colorful shirt, I want to be a bright, happy, nice. Fun dad point added too, I can fault the doctors and nurses who looked after Russ through everything. The first bout of bleeding was a few hours after the 12 week scan, that really scared us. It stopped and everything was okay until that 14 week 3 days bleeding, which followed with the miscarriage 2 days later. But the whole time the hospital staff were incredible, so kind and gentle and compassionate. Say what you will about the NHS and how it's run. But the people on the front line are amazing, and I want to hug each one of them and just say thank you. Even at the end of their long shifts they still maintain their bedside manner and still have drive to ensure you get the best care. That's my experience anyway. Point G's Reddit, my heart. Last year in the chemistry lab me and my friends were doing a fairly simple experiment demonstrating the properties of a form of salt, sodium acetate, it's what they use in those heat packs that harden and heat up when you press the metal thing inside. We were demonstrating how, when you melt the salt to liquid, cool down the liquid, then activate it with a crystal you can watch it slowly crystallize inside the container, look it up, it's really cool. Anyways we had the liquid cooling in the freezer in a beaker but something activated it, and it crystallized, and exploded the beaker, so we just had this brick of salt that wouldn't fit in any glass container, but we still, had to do the demonstration, so my friend found a glass dish, to put on the heat pad, later I learned she found the dish in the biology lab. First mistake, so we put the salt brick in the glass dish on the heat pad, and then it just hit me, that this dish was likely not meant for heat, it just didn't seem like tempered glass I guess, but I had a bad feeling point, so I picked it up, it was barely on the pad for 10 seconds, and looked at the bottom of it, as I guessed it was not tempered glass, I went to set it back down on the counter, but literally right as I was about to do, that the dish exploded in my hands. It sounded like a bomb and glass was everywhere. And my second mistake was not wearing any type of protective gloves, because it shredded one of my fingers and I almost lost the tip of that finger. I had nicks all over both hands and a gash on the side of my pinky all the way through to the nail. Somehow I had cuts on my foot, I was wearing Burke's third mistake. Blood was everywhere. My friends were, just as close to it as I was, but they were fine, and one of them was even helping me set it down when it exploded, but she was fine. The other students and teachers were super helpful, but I ended up having to get like 13 stitches. It was a fun day. A lot of lessons were learned. In my sophomore year, if high school, right after I got my driver's license, it was the night of our mop dance, the girls asked the guys and wear matching t-shirts, and my parents said I could drive the van to go eat dinner, and then to the dance. I had to promise, that I would stay in town, live in a small town with a lake 30 minutes south, and another town 15 minutes east, since it was the beginning of November and I'd only had my license 2 months. There were two couples and we decided that having subway sandwiches by the lakeside, would be awesome and maybe a little romantic. Anyway, we get to the lakeside, and can't see anything because darkness, and it ends up being a little creepy. We finish eating, and load back up into the van. As I start driving up the dirt hill to head back to town, my stomach and heart drop and I stop the car. I try to play it cool, and say in a mom voice, everyone buckle up, or I'm not moving another inch. As a new driver I didn't want to be uncool, and make people wear their seat belts. About 2 miles down the dirt road as I was going about 60 miles per hour I started to fishtail, lost control and ended up running into the ditch and hit a boulder that flipped us, and then rolled, after hitting the embankment. Luckily my date was borrowing his friend's mom's cell phone, this was before the widespread availability of mobile phones, and we were able to call 9 double one. I'll never forget waking up upside down in that van, and wondering what would have happened if I hadn't made everyone put on their seatbelts. This isn't my own gut feeling, but rather my mother's, so it was my dad's weekend for having me. Parents got divorced when I was 3, 
My mom got invited to a birthday party that was 3 hours away from my dad's house. Point my mom got all dolled up and ready to go. As she was driving down the freeway she felt something was wrong. She described it as butterflies followed by the thoughts of something's wrong with Josh. Point I notoriously get hurt at my father's house as he wasn't very responsible and neither was my grandparents who lived with him. They lived on a very large farm and owned many horses. I enjoyed going out and feeding, petting, and watching my grandpa work with them. One day he had me stand back so he could feed them really quick as we were getting ready to leave somewhere. Back to their lack of responsibility and common sense he decided to make me stand behind a horse and go to feed him point as he grabbed hay to feed the horse he dropped the pitchfork and it hit a metal strip on concrete, creating a loud noise. The startled horse instinctively kicked back, striking me, a 4 year old behind it. It hit my leg and then stepped backward onto my calf. As he moved away from me his hoof tore all the skin off my leg somehow. It peeled all of it back from my calf and strung out like the small bit of skin that peels next to your nail point my grandpa immediately picked me up and carried me to the living room where he called my mom to tell her what had occurred and to her gut feeling she was able to come and get me since she was only 10 minutes away rather than 3 hours away point luckily I didn't receive any fractures or a broken leg just a skinless calf and a scar the shape of a line down my calf. I have a weird gut feeling slash instinct story that isn't necessarily scary but still is worthy of sharing point I was a sophomore in high school. It was a normal morning, I was running late to leave for school, I took the bus, the stop was a little 5 minute walk a block away. The family dog, Bengal, had been showing clear signs of being pretty ill the past couple of days. He wasn't throwing up food or having diarrhea but just not eating much and sleeping a ton. He was also 8 or 9 at this point and boxer dogs are known for dying at a younger age than other large dog breeds. However, I didn't know that at the time point I remember that morning he was curled up on the couch, his little brown eyes watching me. I glanced at the time and saw that I had less than 5 minutes to get to the bus stop. This happened from time to time and, being a cross country runner, I'd just run down the block to ensure I didn't miss the bus. I grabbed my lunch, my backpack, and my energy drink, and hauled us out the front door. I had slammed the door behind me in a mild panic, and as I took my first step forward, I stopped. It actually felt as if some unknown force made me stop point immediately I was stricken with the thought, say goodbye to Bengal. I re-entered the house, entered the living room, where he lied on the couch, and told him goodbye, and that I loved him. Then, I left. I went about my day without a second thought about him. My dad picked me up after school for a reason I can't remember. He was silent the entire drive home, which actually wasn't unusual for him, but I noted that he had no music playing which implied something was wrong point. When we pulled up into the driveway he blurted out, Bengal is dead. I saw him fight tears. When he said this, it didn't feel like news. I already knew without having a thought about Bengal besides that morning. Though somehow I knew, nothing prepared me for it. Still to this day, I cry when I think about that dog. He really was the best boy. A few years ago I was actively looking for a new job, while still working my current position. One day on the way home from work I ran into a friend, at the time of course, who I went to college with. We spoke for about 20 minutes to catch up. During that conversation he said that he his job was hiring and told me to stop by the office in a week to speak with his VP. He said he was well connected and he would put in a good word for me. Point fast forward a week later I show up at the office. The building is located in lower Manhattan. Very appealing atmosphere once I entered. The lobby was really nice and had some smaller but notable companies in there. I take the elevator up to where I needed to be and boy let me tell you. Once I got off the elevator this is where I knew something was totally off. This had to be the most rundown floor in the building. The hallway looked as if it was being renovated but never completed and had electrical wiring hanging out the ceiling. I opened the door to the office and was greeted by a receptionist who said the VP will be with me shortly. He comes up to me and says, so glad you can make it. You're just in time for our morning meeting. Mind you this so called VP is no older than 28. 
He then walks me to a room that had at least 30 people in it with no chairs I see the guy who told me to come and questioned him on every red flag that I came across. His reply to everything I asked was, it will all make sense in a second. The VP comes in and yells how are we doing? The crowd replies, great. They did this five times. After the VP started talking it turns this job was, was going door to door and telling people that there was an issue with their con ed bill, which was total utter horse sheet. Once the meeting was over the VP sends them on their way and tells me to go to office point I told me I will decline and proceeded to leave. He then yells, why don't you want to be your own boss? This opportunity that you're not taking is one you will regret. I told him save breath and left. Once I got home and did research it turns out this company regularly scams people and has been doing so for years. They change their name every once in a while to stay under the radar. I told that former friend to lose my number and moved forward with life. Usually late to the party on these, not me but my mother, when I was young we lived in a pretty big house with a finished basement. Me and my siblings would always sleep in the basement in the summer because it stayed cold and we had a game room where we would take turns playing games. That was around the time PlayStation released, so we played hours upon hours of FF7 and I beat Metal Gear Solid multiple times. We had a TV that was on the entertainment center where we would connect a game systems to and another TV mounted on the wall where we would keep either Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network on. Not relevant, but going down memory lane here. Now to get to the point, my parents never really had issues with us sleeping down there as they didn't want to up the account with us complaining. One night we were all sleeping down there, and my mom woke up in the middle of the night with a strong feeling that she should not let us sleep down there that night. She followed that gut feeling and went down to the basement to force us to sleep in our rooms that night. Well that gut feeling turned out to be correct, because when we went down to the basement the next day the TV that was mounted on the wall fell. Keep in mind these are not the flat screens we have today. These are the old heaviest box TVS. It was mounted pretty high up on the wall. The room wasn't that big, so I believe my sister was sleeping in the area where the TV hit. She would have likely gotten seriously hurt if my mother didn't go into the basement to get us that night point TLDR. Mother saved us from a serious injury that would have been caused by a TV falling off the mount by having a gut feeling to force us to sleep in our rooms for a night. Not me but my grandma point back in 2013. My grandpa went away on a week long business trip. Two days into the trip he calls my grandma and while he's talking to her, she stops him and tells him to go to the doctors because he sounded sick. He's a stubborn man. So he refused and blamed it on being tired. Grandma tries to get him to go a few more times, but he continues saying he's just tired. Point she wakes up in the middle of the night crying and comes into my mother's room. My grandma stayed with my mom and I when my grandpa went on business trips, screaming he's dead. He's dead. I feel it. He's dead. My mother dismisses it and says it's a nightmare and to call him in the morning. Point she calls him in the morning. No answer. He's dead, mom's name, he's dead she says to my mom. My mom tells her to call at night because he's probably in a meeting or working. She calls at night again and still no answer. She cries hysterically and repeats her theory, but we dismiss it again. Grandpa is a busy man, maybe he just forgot to call point after another day of calling goes by. My grandpa's boss calls my grandma and asks if my grandpa went home early. This sends my grandma into hysterics and my mom ends up talking to grandpa's boss about when they last saw him and things like that point my mom ended up calling the hotel and asking them to check on his room since he never checked out. They call back a few minutes later saying they couldn't get a hold of him on the phone. Mom tells them to go up to his room. They call back later saying they can't get into his room because it's dead bolted. Mom starts panicking inside and tells them to bust the door down because he might be dead. The front desk lady sounds concerned and says she will call back point an hour or so goes by and my mother receives a call from the fire department or police, I can't remember, confirming that when they forced themselves into the room, my grandpa was unresponsive and pronounced dead. Turns out the night of that phone call, he had a heart attack and died. He was in that hotel room for three days dead. 
My grandma was right the whole time, and she still has moments where she breaks down crying for not trying harder or calling an ambulance for him. I had my first son at 20 years old 6 months after that I noticed a sore spot on my leg. Went to see my GP and they said no big deal looks like a small cyst, here's some antibiotics to help and some opioids for the pain. I took the antibiotics, but not the opioids, because I had a 6 mo old baby at home, and it was just me. I figured the cyst would go away and all would be fine 6 months later no pain, but I noticed the same spot has gotten a little bit bigger, so I go see my GP again. They send me for a court. Again cyst slash abscess dx. Starting to get irritated with it, but figure another round of antibiotics and I'm good. FF 4 years of living with this damn thing, and I'm 25 living in a twisted area. I noticed one day that I was having odd bleeding from my vagina slash rectum. I say odd, because I didn't have periods due to depot birth control. I went on a bike ride with my son, and got home, and felt a gush of blood. So I went to the ER. The ER doc told me it was simply hemorrhoids, and that one had ruptured and that's why I was bleeding. So they cauterized it, and sent me home. Something didn't feel right. I knew that wasn't that easy. I went to another hospital to see if I could talk to another doctor about it. Three hospitals later, and I'm flagged for drug seeking behavior in all three states. Not drug seeking, if I'm not asking for drugs, I beg my abjin to check me because something was wrong. I can't sit or stand without pain. I can't ride a bike or do much of anything at this point because it started to hurt constantly. One morning I felt a burning rip in my vagina. The cyst had basically become so large that it ripped a hole in the wall of my vagina. I was rushed to the hospital I wasn't flagged at and surgery was immediately done. They removed a mass the size of a large orange from my thigh. Sent it off to a lab and found it to be not only cancerous, endometrial stromal sarcoma, but necrotic. It was attached from the very bottom of my uterus and cervix, and stretched around my femoral artery and sciatic nerve. It had been growing for 5 years. I had several other smaller tumors in other places, and began chemo and radiation treatment almost immediately. I was officially NED, no evidence of disease, at 28 and now at 30 after 2 years of fighting to have my hysterectomy, I'm scheduled to get my offending organs cut out in on July 1st. Being net and reducing my risk of recurring cancer means I'm gonna be here for my two kids for much longer than my doctors predicted. Independence Day will have a whole new meaning for me. Anyone from we has probably heard of the many 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 deaths of collage aged males along waterways. Athletic good academics, well known males. Anyway, when I was 22, a group of friends and I, 6 people total, and my then girlfriend, went out to Water Street. A street in the heart of downtown along the river with a string of bars, popular for bar hopping point fast forward to about 11pm that night, I had only 2 beers. From we, we can drink a little, no I'm not bragging, this random guy comes into the group and buys everyone a beer, except me, I had just got a full one. He comes back to the area where we were standing and hands them out. Something about the guy didn't seem right. He was older, with nobody else, and very well kept. I swapped beers with my girlfriend. People drug people at bars. It happens one hour later. I'm stumbling aimlessly. My girlfriend has to keep finding me. I had only had that one beer plus my previous two. And we lost my group point wake up the next day. In my bed girlfriend was fine. I was not. The most dehydrated I've ever been in my life. Barely open my eyes. Pounding headache. Remembered nothing at all. My girlfriend said we were all acting extremely weird, zoned out, and everyone would wander off. I call for a status report on my buddies. One crashed into a gas station with his car, one was taken to the hospital, one was arrested, and the other fell asleep on a park bench across town point where we drugged by mysterious man at the bar in an attempt of murder, I don't know, but my girlfriend was the only one who wasn't affected, and I traded my beer for hers. I want to say right now that this story ends in a sexual assault I will not go into any detail about it, but if you think reading this is going to be bad for your mental health then please don't read it. The last thing I want is to cause anyone distress I was taking part in some good old 
fashioned light college hazing for this club I was in and honestly having a great time. After all the tasks were over and the event ended we all went back to a friend's house to sober up before going back to campus. Everyone one was very drunk this is an important detail because I think everyone who took part in the activities had thrown up at this point at least once. I, being the bad as I thought I was, had way overdone it and had thrown up several time. Very very drunk. This guy I considered my friend was weird he was acting too familiar too much physically contact than is totally appropriate but certainly not problematic. I just got this feeling that I should try to avoid him. So I sat on a couch that had no room for anyone else to sit on with some of my other friends somehow this guy managed to squeeze in next to me. I absolutely froze I could not move and I desperately wanted to be anywhere else. He sexually assaulted me in a room with easily more than 20 people on a couch with 3 other people and no one could tell anything was wrong. Either he was so drunk he didn't know what he had done or was hoping I didn't remember or something I couldn't tell you what he was thinking. He never denied what he did he just either genuinely did not remember or played dumb to save face point 3 days after attacking me, he tried asking me out on a date. I had to tell my attacker what he did to me. I was an 18 year old freshman in her first semester. He was a 23 year old man and he ruined my life. It's been a couple years. I had to drop out of college I was so terrified all the time and I couldn't sleep or do much of anything else. I'm getting better but I will definitely never be the same and I don't think I will ever get over it at this point I'm hoping that it doesn't consume me and I'm able to find pockets of joy point I know this isn't the sort of thing people want to hear about but talking about it gives me validation and most of the time I desperately need it. So if you have read my story thank you. Knowing people care about what happened to me and countless other women helps me feel a bit better. I must have been about 12 years old. The family and I had just been down to the river for a day of fishing and hauling. This is in Zambia, Africa. There was my parents and my three siblings in our double cab vehicle towing our boat with a trailer. It must have been about 7 at night driving the 200 km stretch back home. We had just seen some oranges on the side of the main road. This is just a Tallinn, tar road through the wildlands of Zambia. So we see the oranges just as we are passing. And my mum sees them, and as we pass them, she says she would like some. My dad then says we would stop at the next ones, if there are any. Usually what happens is we stop, and a local man slash woman slash kid will run up and sell you some quickly. So about 10 minutes down the road we see some in the headlights propped up on a plastic bucket. As we start slowing down I know in my gut something is wrong. I don't say anything. As we stop I see a large rock flung out the elephant grass near the road at the car. My dad must not have seen it. Not a second later my mother's passenger window is shattered by another rock and my dad sees this and immediately floors it. Wheel spinning back onto the road. My mum is covered in glass pieces now but everyone is fine. We can't call the police or nothing because it won't amount to anything just in case you were wondering. Mainly because the perpetrators will have vanished by then and police will not be able to do anything. We eventually stop about 20 minutes away all shaken up and clean out all the glass and such off of my mum. Was quite a shaky night. Because what they were trying to do was probably confuse my dad and he would stop and probably give them enough time to grab them and steal our car and who knows what else. Especially us being white may be even worse to my mother and sisters. Still a bit scary thinking what may have happened had my dad not acted fast enough. My dog, 11 year old Sheety Zedu, is the nicest little grandma baby in the whole wide world and is never ever mean to anybody. My cat is a 4 year old Maine Coon Norwegian forest cat mix who's quite small for his breed, he was the runt of the litter and only surviving kitten. Together they're the best of friends. Which surprised me when said best friend started acting weird towards one of my neighbors. My dog had growled, snapped, and barked at the neighbor and his wife for the first time ever in her entire lifetime. My cat's behavior towards them was standard for any other person he didn't know or like. Hissing, scratching, biting, screaming bloody murder. My neighbors bring homeless people into their apartment and sometimes said homeless people wander out at night. 
One night I'm watching TV and chilling with my little companions and my dog, the sweetest little fluff ball in existence, bares her teeth and starts barking her little head off, which alerted my cat and he, being connected to my dog, got protective and began screeching and swatting at the window. So I went over to see what they were losing their sheet for, and I see the neighbor's wife just standing outside my door holding something and staring into the peephole and tapping on the door. I remove the chain lock as loudly as I possibly could to see what she'd do, and she immediately began to scramble off, and I did go outside yelling for her to bring her as back here, and face me, if she's so grown enough to scare my furry friends. Unfortunately my cat had gotten outside, and began swiping at her ankles, and biting them till she slammed the door and he came back, like he didn't do anything to her. Thankfully I have cameras installed, and she was caught in the act. She'd smeared her used tampons on my door and scared my friends for literally no reason other than her husband being a creep towards me indirectly and she wanted revenge for me being an attention seeking slouched. She was also caught with two of the homeless people as lookouts, we all still live in the same complex, but she hasn't done much now point at it, the cops came and she was made to disinfect and repaint the entire door. When I was around 19 my friend and I were out clubbing. Now, back then I was a big drinker and loved having a good time, but would never go home with guys. My friend on the other hand was a bit more wild. If someone offered her something, she took it. If she was invited back to a guy's house, she would go. Usually I would pick her up the next morning from wherever she ended up. But this one night this guy and his friend were hanging out with us and being super friendly. Not only were they polite, they were both very good looking. As we were leaving, they invited us to party with them somewhere else. For some unknown reason I had a very uneasy feeling. These guys were too perfect. They didn't seem to have any flaws at all which had alarm bells ringing in my head. So I politely declined and told my friend she could crash at my place. One of the guys said back quote, but your friend wants to party with us, come and get her in the morning. My friend was starting to follow them out when I grabbed her arm. She resisted and said back quote I want to go party. I basically said back quote no we are going home. You are not going anywhere but my house. As I'm saying this I'm dragging her pretty forcefully away from them while they are trying to pull her the other way. Which started a bit of a struggle. I eventually yelled back quote fuck off and leave us alone. Which had people looking in our direction. So they apologized and told us to have a good night point my friend was pretty upset with me even the next morning when we got up. About a week later, the same guys were arrested for rap and murder. Turns out after we left, they convinced another set of girls to go with them to back quote party. They drove them to the forest and rapped and murdered them. We were both pretty shook up about it and my friend told me if I ever told her to come home with me in future she would without question. I also noticed she went home with guys far less after that. My reasons for being concerned may have been a bit beachy, but there is no mistaking that feeling of dread you get and you know something is wrong. My wife was selling a used iPhone on the through one of those selling apps. She had it listed at $300 and a guy offered to buy it full price, which is rare in this kind of apps since people usually tends to offer less than the posted price. Anyways, she agreed to meet with the buyer at his address, to which I offered to drive her. When we got to the place, it was pretty rundown house in a not so nice of a neighborhood. The thing is that the buyer was texting us up to an hour before we arrived, telling us that he was waiting for us. But after we got to the location, he stopped responding. We also noticed that the door to the house was open, which immediately rang all of my bells. Inside of the house, it was dark and quiet. We kept texting the buyer, but he would still not reply. I asked my wife not to get out of the car and just wait and see. We waited for 25 minutes and we saw absolutely no movement inside of the house, despite the open door. Finally we decided it was time to leave, and while driving away, I looked over my rear mirror, just to see two guys coming out of the house, and staring in our direction. One of them had something in his hand which seemed like a pair of scissors. My wife was totally oblivious of the whole situation, in the meantime I was sweating bullets while driving away. 
I mentioned it to her later, and she couldn't believe it point for a while. After that situation, I couldn't stop thinking about what could have happened if I hadn't driven my wife there and she had gone by herself. Late to the game but last year my boyfriend and I had to relocate to a different city for a few months for his job, so we packed a few suitcases and our cats and moved to a temporary house point a month or so into being away from our house I decided to take a trip back home just to check on things and grab a few items we realized we needed in our temp city. In our home we had this office with big glass French doors that connected directly to the living room and in the office were these beautiful bay windows looking into our backyard. Now the windows were original to the house, built in 1925 and were very easy to pry open and did not block sound out at all. Our backyard also had two ways to get in, one from the front yard and then a back gate which was on the main road. So I'm sitting on the couch, it's about 1.30am and I get the uncomfortable feeling that I'm being watched. I try texting my boyfriend, but he's asleep, so I text my friend who is awake. I just figured I'm alone and letting my imagination run. My friend is tells me I'm just being paranoid and I agreed. About 10 minutes later I start hearing leaves crunching and twigs breaking. The sound of it was like it was someone pacing back and forth outside the bay window. I tell my friend this, and he's saying it's probably just a raccoon, but if I'm scared I should call the police. I start calling the police, and as I'm looking out the window into pitch black I see a phone screen out of nowhere light up. I ran into the hallway, and hid in the closet until the police got there. Thank goodness it was only a few minutes. The police go in the back and search everywhere. It's a decent sized yard considering we live in a downtown neighborhood. They check the shed, two patios and found nothing. But outside of my bay window they found a bag of half-eaten chips and a soda. The police put it off that we must forgotten it out there, which I know we didn't because one why would we be eating chip on the ground in an inconvenient spot. Two it was a brand I've never had and it was summertime in central Florida and had been raining almost daily and this bag of chips was dry and clean. Plus we had been gone for a month. It freaked me the fuck out that I got out of there that night and stayed at a hotel down the road. Anyways so two more months pass by and it's time for us to move back home. When we get home I'm talking to the girl who lives across the street from me with her husband. She's asking me if I heard what happened. I tell her no and asked. The day after my bad feeling night her and her husband came home to a man sitting on their couch naked with a gun. This man had gone through their home. Tried on her husband's clothes, took down all of their framed pictures of them together, broke their bed, ate their leftovers, and is on camera playing with their dog. We also found out that this same man tried breaking into another girl's house earlier that day, but her boyfriend scared him off. For some dumb reason they didn't call the cops. I scares me to think what cold happened. If I had gone to bed early point another gut feeling I had was a few years ago I was at a hotel on a short layover. I'm a flight attendant and I get the feeling I should check to make sure the balcony door is locked, which I never bother with because we are required to be on the second floor or higher. Anyways I force myself to get up and check. I open the curtains and there's a man in a hoodie standing on my balcony staring back at me, which the balcony was not locked. I screamed and have never ran faster in my life. Turns out is, was the man in the room next mine, and he jumped over the little divider between balconies. Didn't sleep that night. Okay, I don't think I've ever told this story to an outsider, or in its entirely so this is gonna be a bit long, but the backstory is important, and I think you'll get why by the end as it paints a picture of Adam Brotherton. Attempted murderer, an evil violent charming sadistic manipulative rapist point. When I was 14 to 16 I was a major goth and we all used to crowd into the city center and gather in our hundred at the time. There was this lad called Adam Brotherton who called himself Wraith at the time point this cunt sexually abused and rapped me. I say sexually abuse at first rather than rap as such with him was initially consensual, but he majorly pushed the boundaries of what was acceptable very quickly. It was rap both statutory and actual, and rapped loads of girls when he was in a foster placement, and in town he was coercing a lot of underage girls into having sex with him. He was good at keeping people quiet and ashamed point I told a girl this who was interested in him, 
told her what he did to me, and warned her to stay away, and for some reason Adam's girlfriend rather redirected her anger at him onto me for having spoken up. I was walking out of the park, and I felt a tap on my shoulder, turned around and was punched square in the nose which broke, and blood cascaded down my face. I was so shocked that I could only ask her why did you do that, whilst she screamed bloody murder at me annoyed how dare I say sheet about her many CT, and was kept at a distance by a lad who stepped in, and he got me out of there, still so thankful as I truly think she would have really hurt me, and at the time I was entirely non-violent and incapable of defending myself point we found some police eventually, and I had to insist they do something about the minor, covered in blood in front of them. Pointed her out, and asked them to act. They urged me to let her buy me some chicken nuggets. And get past it point it was quite clear they didn't want to do the paperwork, but my continued insistence and me saying, if they wouldn't take us to the station I would call, treble 9 and find some police officers willing to do their job. They took us to the station, on foot and made me walk miles out of spite for me having the audacity, to ask them to do their jobs that's not the main story just of importance. After she attacked me, she wasn't properly charged, but her parents were informed, and she was no longer allowed to go to town anymore except for specific treats now Adam was majorly pushing sheet. He'd been living with some friends, and they found him wrapping a girl in their flat, and kicked him out, and then I spoke up as did some other people and we as the rocker community made the decision to kick him out, and make him unwelcome. I wasn't around for this part, but from what I know the guys cornered him on mass and told him to go of our city and never return or they'd never find his body point so he left. He'd been so for surfing with anyone who'd have him and was making no efforts to change that and lived on the goodwill of others. He was handsome, charming, he was manipulative and knew how to mask the monster a kind middle-aged man took him in for the night and allowed him to stay. He stayed there for a bit and then as Adam always did. He started stealing the guy's belongings, he pawned his PS2, 2007, and some other stuff and the police were involved, and Adam wasn't there. The police left, and Adam returned, and upon finding out what poor Ian had done, reporting him, after taking him into his flat, feeding him out of the kindness of his heart. I feel sick to continue, but I will point Adam Frog march the poor man up a nearby hill at Niffer Point, stabbed him repeatedly, so that he could immobilize him, bound him to a tree, poured petrol over the man and set him alight. Point Adam stood there laughing and tormenting the man as he burned. The poor man managed somehow to free himself. If I remember correctly the poor guy managed to flee a distance and signal for help but that's fuzzy. He lives with two thirds body full thickness burns and the injuries are life changing point he lives every day suffering from what Adam did to him both mentally and physically. He boldly testified in court against Adam and the court and judge ECT were justifiably horrified by the evidence before them and found him guilty on a ton of charges. In court he tried to blame us kicking him out of our space as reason for his actions. He's so deeply manipulative and frankly evil, and I'm very glad he is behind bars. I'm entirely sure it would have been one of us, and soon from how he was behaving, I've not even gone into the faked up sheet he did elsewhere in the city ECT point I would have been his victim had he stayed, he had groomed me well, and I was then smitten with this dark handsome dangerous manipulative man who would have become a serial killer had he not been so careless and his victim filled with such a will to live and survive. At that age I had no such instinct point news article below, took some digging to find it, but I managed to find it last moment. So yay, I'm sure I came exceptionally close to being his murder victim and honestly I wouldn't be surprised had he not murdered someone prior. He had threatened me with a knife and strangled me prior and still I adored him because he was so very good at being manipulative point feel free to ask me questions if you like. My replies may be a little slow, but I will pay special attention today as I imagine it's likely that if this post doesn't get lost in the list then there might be a few questions asked. My cousin and I went for a walk in the woods slash farm fields near his house when we were young. I was around 11 and he was 13. We were out there because he told me he found this awesome tree fort that he wanted to show me. So we walk about 25 minutes into the forest area, and we find the tree fort and climb up it. All was well for about 10 minutes, but then I looked off into the distance, and saw a dog walking in our general direction. 
I looked to the right a bit, and saw another one, and then to the left of those two there was another, all walking in our direction. They were maybe about a football field away, but the more I looked the more I realized oh shit, those look like coyotes they are pretty common in my area, lots of warning signs saying to be vigilant, so I point them out to my cousin and he goes it's funny you say that. Because I see two more off in that direction, and he points behind me to the right so we look at each other, both visibly scared. I said okay, we really should go, before they get closer, but he wanted to stay up there, and wait for them to leave. I said look, I'm leaving now, and you're either coming with me, or you're staying up here, until I come back with your dad, so he agrees to come with me, and we slowly climb down, then we turn back towards the house in full sprint. I've never ran faster in my entire life. Anyways, we get to the residential area at the end of the farm fields and turn back, and look and at the edge of the forest, where we had just come out of a minute ago, there was probably around 10 coyotes just standing there staring in our direction. Probably deciding whether or not it was worth it to chase us, I don't know what would have happened if we had stayed, but I'm glad we didn't. This was way before cell phones, so lord knows how long we could have been stuck up there waiting for them to leave, or if they would have even left at all. My aunt. She was married to my uncle for 10 years, but eventually they got a divorce. My uncle had like 3 cats that loved him and never liked my aunt, but my uncle is long gone and hasn't said a single thing to us or visited. One of the cats that was given to them by my great grandma got really depressed because he was gone and started peeing on the floor. Anyways, my aunt up meeting this guy named Patrick. He had no job and his hair was matted really bad. I thought he was really weird when I saw that my aunt's bed was covered in stuffed animals and that he would cuddle them all the time. Every time she brought him to family functions he would step out of the room and call his daughter. My mom had told me that he molested his daughter and that she thought that when he called her it was actually his parole officer or something. This turned out to be true by the way. He ended up getting a job at a local Texaco and wasn't acting sus for a long time. Until one day my mom drove to my aunt's and ended up seeing him strangling my great grandma's cat because the smell of cat pee made him very very upset. He was kicking it around the driveway. My mom freaked out on him about it but his eyes were glossed over and he didn't even notice her screaming at him to stop. She ended up beating his ass and putting the cat in the front seat of her car and she drove away to pick me up from subway across town. When I opened the door my mom was crying, and in the passenger seat was my poor great grandma's little baby bleeding out of her nose and having brief grand mal seizures. I held her crying on a way to the vet, and she died in my arms. The worst part about the something ain't right feeling is that my aunt was in denial and never got a single bad vibe from him. They ended up breaking up a year later but now if me or my mom get bad vibes from her boyfriend she listens to us because she never realized how awful he was until he left her and put himself into a mental hospital. I know this doesn't fully apply but when my brother was in high school he had a friend I was terrified of the instant I saw him. I was probably 5th 6th grade at the time and my mom teased me at first for being shy because he was pretty cute. There was absolutely nothing wrong with this guy. But I didn't want to be anywhere near him. He saw me watching him once as he got out of his car to walk up to our door. The only time I can remember our eyes ever meeting and I felt my blood run cold. I was dead convinced he was evil point I told my mom about this and she said to trust my feelings and not go near him. I gladly did as she said, but I still dreaded days when my brother would say that the friend was coming over. I just didn't feel safe point eventually they went their separate ways. Years later I looked him up on Facebook and saw he was a normal guy, was working at a grocery store, nothing off about him, and I actually acknowledged he was sort of attractive and that I'd been done before to not have a massive crush on this guy point fast forward another two years or so and my mom tells me my brother and that friend are forming a band together. Immediately all those feelings return. I want to pick up the phone and tell my brother to stop it right now. I tell her how I feel, and instead of what she used to say, she tells me to grow up. She says it's not like I have superpowers or something, I can't just sense when someone's not right. I get upset, but she refuses to hear me out. 
I never mention it again point the band didn't ever really get started, and as far as I know they haven't hung out much since high school. But I'm still downright terrified of him 23 years old, and I still believe with my entire being that that man is evil. I don't know what he's done or what he will do, but I'm so glad my brother seems to have finally drifted out of that friendship. I think I'd have lost my sanity by now otherwise. Went to a pretty small college, everyone ended up in the same classes, at the same parties, etc. Freshman year I became really close with this girl, B after a few months B starts dating this guy, D now D always kind of creeped me out, he was 25 living in our freshman dorms, and I don't know man, but as a 26 year old today, I can't fathom living that life. Especially combined with the fact that our dorms were $12,000 a year to live in, which is considerably more than other on-campus housing. Anyways, even though he was older, he always seemed to be so much more immature than us 18-year-olds. For example, he literally sobbed in public one night when we walked into a common area of the dorms in short shorts. Of course this sheet really rubbed me the wrong way and I began hinting to B that she needed to get the hell away from D, but B felt bad for D, citing that he was just insecure and needed some love. I felt uneasy for my friend, but I wasn't going to push the topic, because even though we were close, our friendship was still new. Eventually D picked up that I wasn't complying with his manipulative BS and became pretty passive aggressive with me. By this point almost everyone realized D was an insecure man baby, except B, but I could never shake the feeling that there had more to the story. This was first confirmed the day we found an iPod left in B's room and, in order to identify the owner we went to the photo albums. Well it ended up being a bunch of fetish born and all the girls looked like young teens, and L mean young, followed by pics that identified the owner as being D we exited really quickly, and being two 18 year old girls, we both felt too uncomfortable about what we saw to have the discussion we should have had. I just kind of gave B a look like seriously, and she just uncomfortably shrugged. I did my best to help B out of the situation, but the more I thought I was supporting her, the more annoyed with me she became. Today I would have probably handled this differently but back then I just kind of backed away from my friendship for my own sanity. I wish I could say that was the end of it but oh no. Fast forward 6 years to about 2 weeks ago when my insomnia and anxiety drove me to check the such offend list in my area at 3am. You got it folks, there was D's picture next to some charges about soliciting sech from a minor. After inquiring with some of my friends from school, apparently this sheet took place our senior year, when he was 28 over 29, and everyone knew except me. My mom's cousin was in town and we all went to go see him, he was staying with my grandparents. After asking why we hadn't heard about cousin Johnny until now, she said he was in jail, and just got out. Excuse me what the fuck? Just gonna take my kids to see my cousin who just got out after assaulting his mom. No big deal point anyway they all apparently thought he was innocent because Johnny's mom was batshit crazy, always pulled weird sheet with them. Everyone seemed to love the guy, they thought he was hilarious. I never did. I stayed away from him, he just rubbed me the wrong way. The way he talked and the way he acted just seemed fake. He also said some things that seemed racist which made me want to keep my distance even more. Point one day I get a text from my mom that says to make sure the doors are locked and that if Johnny comes to the house to call the police immediately and that the gun is in a safe in their closet. Point I don't find out why until later. He was staying with his brother and his sister-in-law and apparently rapped and then tried to murder his sister-in-law. She got away, got in a car and sped off. He got in his truck and followed her, rammed her off the road. Police arrived as he was smashing in her window with a tire iron point everyone had that whole oh my god I can't believe he'd do this reaction while I'm sitting there thinking that dude was obviously faked up. A neighbor from my parents old house. I don't remember what was the first thing because I was little but I never liked her. Some stuff I remember. She would open the refrigerator in my house like it was hers. She would get into my room without knocking and wouldn't even turn around if I was naked. Eventually I realized she intended to come in when I was naked. Imagine if genders were reversed. 
She told everyone I was her best friend, even though I never did anything friend like with her. The point is it was a small town, so she was looking better by association and making me look worse in the process. She had a boyfriend who was the sketchiest guy I've known. He dumped her because she was insane. His words. All these stuff wasn't a big deal and my family always liked her, but I never trusted her. I remember I had a big fight with my mom one time we were out of town and she gave her a key to our house point jump forward some years after I moved out at 18. Her first kid looks like a clone of her ex-boyfriend. She kicked her mom out of the house and made her live in a small room on the back. Her mom still paid for everything including vacations, new car, etc. But she also stole her credit card. She completely managed all her money and sometimes didn't live her enough to eat. When her mom finally said enough after at least 10 years of that she accused her of kidnapping her because she's adopted and there's no adoption papers, which has a very simple explanation. The adoption happened 30 years ago in the third world. They just walked into a hospital and asked for an abandoned baby, like everyone did back then. When she finally was kicked out of the house she made a scene and had to be dragged out by the police in front of her kids. When my mom told me all this happened was the biggest I told you so in my life. Last I heard she was trying to fake an injury on the city hall to scam the city and she got injured for real. This happened last month. I do have gut feelings often, but I have never had proof, like I do with this one point I went home for my lunch break, which I never do, and as I left the house I said goodbye to my chinchilla, raptor. I got in my truck, called my friend, and I was absolutely railroaded by a sense of panic. I could feel an overwhelming sense of dread in the bottom of my stomach. I took some deep breaths and tried to channel what the energy was about and concluded that it was medically related. I told my friend I have a doctor appointment the next day, maybe it was about that. I said it didn't feel right, it doesn't feel like it's about me, but when I thought about every person close to me, I couldn't feel it about them either. I texted my boyfriend and another friend describing the feelings I was having point the next day I go to the doctor, the appointment went well, but the feeling of dread did not go away. I didn't sleep, I couldn't eat, I was consumed with doom and gloom. That night I went to see Endgame at a very late showing, and I did not get home until midnight, which was rare for me. I immediately go to feed my chinchilla, and I see him trapped between two bars of his cage, and he had tried to chew his arm off to get free. I understandably freaked out, got him to the emergency vet, and three weeks later, and $1,200, he is fully healed. Point I thank my intuition for preparing me for this horrific situation, and even though I couldn't stop it from happening, I was on high alert, and will not discount these types of feelings in the future. I was into some rough sheet when I was in high school. I dealt drugs and the like. One night I got home and sat down on my bed. Right as I sat down my phone buzzer went off and I checked my caller ID. I don't remember the name exactly but something about it felt familiar. I have an amazing memory for numbers but am sheet with words so I swapped over to the phone number. I couldn't tell you why but something about the number felt gross. It felt wrong to read the number a couple hours pass and a friend who we'll call in Reek calls me. He asks me if I'm okay and where I'm at. When I tell them I'm at home he sighs in relief. A short conversation later and I'm caught up on the situation. Enrique was invited to the same party but was busy helping his mom. Rather than go he found someone who was going to go and asked him to fill him in on the goings on of the night and tell him if he was missing out. Enrique got a call saying that people were dropping dead or getting really sick. Eventually the line goes dead and Enrique calls the cops the drinks were poisoned. Everyone who had gone was either shot after passing out or managed to escape somehow. The person who did it, we'll call him Jose, had written several pages about why. Jose had gone batshit a couple months prior and last I heard from him, he was in the big white. He was released and immediately threw a party. In his note he told a story about how the angels of Satan spoke to him in the divine way that only the pure could hear. They told him stories of the gods and of the devils. They talked of the unjust and the unclean. He learned of the pure and the impure. And he concluded that consciousness was a dream and that God was keeping us asleep. 
the devils were only evil because God controlled our dreams, and if we could see things for how they really are, we would side with Satan. Point the only way to wake up was to die, and so Joe took it upon himself to be Satan's missionary. They found Joe's brain painting the upstairs bathroom wall. He has cut off all of his fingers, except his right index, and his penis was in the sink. GC, good cousin MC, male cousin FC, female cousin A, aren't you, uncle during summer break, when I was 12 I went to go see my uncle in Oregon. I was there with some of my cousins for about a month, and then it was time to go back. We were going to take a plane to Texas, and stay there for a few days with a family friend four of my cousins were back after that, and GC, the oldest, around 16, was staying behind to spend some time with his dad. I was given the option of going home, or staying with some of my dad's side of the family, who offered to pay for a plane ticket back home. I chose to stay. I got there, and saw that everything was exactly the same as I remembered it. Around you greeted me at the door. The second I got there there they started trying to feed me. I'm half Arab so every bite was met with tackle. Tackle I played some Minecraft with MC, and watched some horror movies with FC. The visit was going great. We decided to for a night in the town, and went for frozen yogurt at a mall, because it was the best froyo place in Texas. After getting frozen yogurt A suggested we rent a movie. I started to go, but he grabbed my shoulder. He said we wanted to talk to me. So A took MC and FC to the red box on the other side of the mall point at this point I should probably mention something. My parents divorced, because my dad was an abusive, alcoholic, drug addict. I rarely saw him. I didn't want to see him, because my last few memories of him weren't great. The last time I'd talked to him in person, was when I was in third grade. FC was putting me in some of her clothes, jewelry, shoes, and makeup. He got drunk, and started yelling at us. During Christmas my fifth grade year he called, and my mom, and went into a different room and he started talking to me. He was being perfectly fine, but eventually started taking about how he was better now and all that. Then he started taking about how he was going to hire a lawyer and get custody of me and take me to Morocco, I have dual citizenship. My mom took the phone and told me to leave. The last thing I'd heard was him shouting at her through the phone. So the last I wanted was to see him. Enough exposition, back to the story point you says to me hey, why you don't wanna see your dad. I didn't know how to respond, so I stayed silent. He kept going. I talked to him on the phone. He was so upset. Talking about how his only kid doesn't want to see him. He was so upset. I mean, he was crying man. He looked at me with a disappointed and slightly angry expression. I felt like something was off, but kept going. Will you see him? Will you do that for me? Will you see your dad? At this point, it was blatant emotional manipulation, but I was too innocent to see that's what it was. So, I said sure. At this point every instinct was screaming this is wrong, but I ignored it. We got back to house, and eventually my dad showed up. He looked, terrible. His teeth were all but gone, his hair was falling out in clumps and he smelled like chemicals. I later figured out that the smell was heroin. He hugged me, and I felt like Draco in that scene in the Deathly Hallows where Voldemort hugs him. It was so awkward and uncomfortable. There were so many warning signs. I ignored them all. Until the next day. At breakfast we are all talking, and you asks if I'd like to see Morocco. I said yeah, eventually. He then said something that really made my gut go instantly go you need to leave. Now, he said of course. What did you think I already had your plane ticket to Morocco? I laughed and excused myself. I went and grabbed my tablet, I didn't have a phone, and messaged my GC. The string is on the wall. It was something we said to each other when we needed to be picked up or there was something going on and we needed help. I packed up stuff and he told my mom what was happening. My mom let you know that I was leaving. Then, all hell broke loose. My dad came in taking about how he was going to take me six flags and we were going to have so much fun. I started crying and bombarding me with questions switching between English and Arabic so much it made my head spin. You started yelling at me. MC and FC ignored me. GC got there not long afterward. You and my dad had already left. I hugged everyone still at the house and told them goodbye. 
I found out after a little bit that my dad and you had bought a return ticket using my Moroccan citizenship so they could get me to Morocco. MC used it instead of me. I'm so glad I followed my gut feeling, even if I did wait until it was almost too late. TLDR my dog was acting nervous, so I left camp earlier than planned. Found out last weekend that a literal axe murderer had been prowling in the area point I went back poking by myself for the first time at the end of this last school year and took my brother's dog, buddy, with me to play it safe. I went to an area on the Appalachian Trail that I had backpacked in several times before, so I was fairly familiar with the area. It was raining the day I was supposed to hike in, so I timed it just right so I wouldn't have to set up camp in the rain. I was watching Buddy pretty closely because this was his first trip anywhere with me and we had to cross several swinging bridges on the way to camp. For non-dog owners out there, doggos tend to freak out when the floor slash ground moves under their feet. He did great the whole way there, he was really relaxed, and I could tell he was happy. However, when we got to camp his demeanor changed. He got really serious and wouldn't let me walk 10 feet away from him without having a full-blown meltdown. I could feel something was off and was uneasy, but I had just finished setting up camp and the rain was starting again. I had made Buddy his own shelter, so he could have a little freedom, but he insisted in sleeping in the tent with me. I tried to let him out to pee a couple times, but he never left the entrance to the tent. Needless to say, between my own gut feeling and how Buddy was acting, I was pretty freaked out. I hardly slept that night and was determined to pack out at first light. However, in the morning I was like nah, I already paid for the day. I might as well stay and enjoy it. I know what you are thinking. Dang, if this was a horror movie she would be dead right? Well throughout the day I kept getting more nervous so I left. Found out at a family gathering this last weekend that a dude with a hatchet had been attacking and killing hikers along the trail. When I was 9 my best friend's parents got divorced. I don't know if this is when I started to get a bad feeling about him or before, but I always got an unsettling feeling around him, and I never really felt comfortable sleeping over at her house. Note, her mom moved out. He had custody of my friend every other weekend, but we didn't have contact with her mom, so his house was the only place we could hang out, because she also switched schools when I was 12. I remember going over to my best friend's housed with another friend I had made for a sleepover. We were getting along well, having fun, but as it got later I felt really uneasy, had this bad gut feeling, and couldn't fall asleep. I ended up getting my mom to pick up me and my new friend and bring us to my new friend's house. My best friend's dad said she couldn't go with us. My best friend was kinda upset with me for leaving with my new friend, but in the end we were still friends year and a bit later. After graduating from middle school, I was 13, and I arranged to hang out with my old best friend again as we hadn't seen each other for a while. She comes over to my camp, and she tells me that her father had sexually assaulted her a couple months ago point she doesn't see him anymore, thank god, but it makes me wonder what would have happened if I had chosen to stay that night, whether I saved myself from something, or my new friend, or even my best friend or her little sister. My brother and I were driving about 2-3 to three hours away from New Orleans to pick up a dog that he was adopting. On our way there, we saw a ton of police cars flying by us through these rural roads, like 12 to 13 of them. I wondered what was going on, but we didn't see anything else weird, so we just kept driving point we get to the house, meet the dog, her name is Taylor and she's the sweetest thing in the world, and start heading home. The whole process takes maybe an hour. On our way home, suddenly behind us a car comes flying, flashing their lights, honking and waving at us to pull over. I start to pull over, thinking it was somebody who needed help when suddenly I think to myself this is a horrible idea, we are in rural Louisiana and there were a ton of cops earlier. I get a really bad feeling and just peel out as their door is opening. We make it to the interstate without the car following us and get home without incident. I had a hard time of putting it out of my head because I was worried that I just abandoned somebody who actually needed help. I felt awful the whole ride home, worried. 
I read in a news article the next day that there was a shooting at a convenience store and the culprits had escaped police in a stolen car that looked a lot like the one that had pulled behind us. My guess is that the police were looking for this car and since the shooters were still driving around, they were going to rob us and take our car to continue to avoid the cops. One of my 21 at the time. Five-year-old students wasn't feeling well when we picked her up from class. I work in after-school care on campus. One of my co-workers picks up kindergarten. First grade through fifth graders walk themselves over. I check in all the older kids, find the missing ones, then check and kinders. Anyway. This student, we'll call her Katie, was struggling to breathe. Not a lot, just a little. We have nothing in her paperwork that would say why this might be, but her twin sister, Jill, said oh, mom gave her her inhaler this morning. Okay, so she has mild asthma maybe? Mind you, this is a girl's second year with us. I've known them since they were two. Older brother in the program, they used to come with dad at pickup. Never seen an issue with breathing before, even in hot weather, during games, during spring, never. So I've got no real reason to be too worried, but protocol says we should call the parents and I wanted to anyway, because it just didn't seem right point I tell her dad on the phone that she's struggling a little. He tells me she doesn't have asthma exactly, but her doctor calls it wheeziness and she sometimes uses an inhaler. I asked if she used it that morning before school, he said maybe, if mom gave it to her to use, but he was unaware. I said that Jill said she had used it, he confirms it's possible, and is on his way, to pick them up anyway, he was already off work, but his commute from work is about 30 to 40 minutes most of the time. I promised to keep an eye on her, and have her take it easy until he arrives, and then I skipped signing kids in, to go look at her. For no real reason, I was very uneasy about this, but I figured dad'll be here soon, we just gotta keep her from getting worse. Shouldn't be too hard point when I walked out there to the snack tables. Oh man. She looked very tense in her shoulders, refused to eat. I walked over and talked to her slash other kids nearby just to be closer to her and hear her speak. It doesn't sound easy and I can see her lips, nails and throat are turning blue. I called my assistant over, she's higher than me, and with our lead out for the day she was the one in charge on site, I'm right below her, and said we needed to take Katie inside, and do a swallow test. Gave Katie a little water. Took her 10 seconds, to move the water to the back of her mouth and 15 to swallow, and it looked difficult slash painful. I asked if her throat felt tight, and she said no, but it was hard to swallow. Did it hurt? Yes, she said. So I called our nurse, we always have one on call, and explained what we were seeing, and what Katie was describing. Nurse says, I'm concerned about an aphylaxis. Can you have someone get the EP pen, and call 9, double 1, and you stay with the student, and on the line with me, because, of reasons. I ended up leaving my phone with my assistant, and took her phone, to get the EP pen, and call 9, double 1, we learned later this sends an alert to my assistant's mom, I administered the EP pen myself, paramedics arrived within 5 minutes of me giving the EP pen, and said that her throat was already swelling back up point long story short, Katie was in the air until well after midnight. She had taken her mother's inhaler at 5.45 that Wednesday morning, had trouble breathing all day at school. We picked her up at 2. At 2.45 I talked to her dad on the phone. At 2.55 I called the nurse. At 3 I gave the EP pen. At 3.05 the paramedics walked in. At 6.25 the next morning, she was waiting for us to open at 6.39 to be dropped off point my assistant and I were on the phone, bouncing between class phone and both of our cell phones, with our supervisor, the on-call nurse, our site nurse, who is the head nurse for the district, Katie's parents, separately, constantly. From 3 to 5 point it was strangely hilarious when I called my supervisor though. A lot of the time, that my lead is out, we have intense behavior problems and I have to call her for final decision approval or sometimes help, student did x, I don't know the protocol. So I just said in the calmest voice, hey Nicole and she goes hi Jezo, hi. Okay, what happened? Oh, you haven't heard yet? We had to call, many hours, and led to anaphylaxis. 
At first there was no real sign it was a truly serious case and she wasn't diagnosed with asthma, so we had no reason to be heavily worried that it was a little hard to breathe. This happens all the time with kids, by the way, and usually resolves itself fairly quickly. In the span of 10 minutes she went from vaguely uncomfortable to needing an EP pen. 5 minutes after the first dose she was swelling back up, you need to wait 10 minutes between doses, and paramedics had to rush her to the ER. Was delivering pizza one night, and about 10 minutes to close, I was making my last two deliveries for the night. The first stop was to a somewhat shady apartment area then the next was about 3 blocks away. After the first delivery I was walking to my car and a couple people showed up asking me a seemingly innocent question. Mind you they were black, and I didn't want to stereotype or anything, so I stopped and answered their question. They seemed a bit on edge, so I got in my car and drove to the next stop. I had my company's delivery sign on the roof of my car, that is all lit up, literally a beacon in the night. I got to the second house, that was also in the middle of a large townhouse development, and had to go to the backside of this particular townhome as that's where the front door was. With the previous stop fresh in my mind I started to feel uneasy slash worried about the vibe I was getting from the two guys. After dropping off the pizza, I ran back to my car, to go back to the pizza joint. Sure enough as soon as I backed out of the parking stall. The two guys earlier flanked my car, and pointed a gun in my face demanding my money. Fight or flight response kicked in, and I dropped the car into first, and sped away as fast as possible with me ducking. Got back to the pizza place, called the police, and smoked a couple cigarettes. That was the first and only time, so far, I've been held up. I know if I didn't run back to my car, after dropping off the pizza at the second house, I would have been jumped without anyone noticing. This happened about 10 years ago, I must have been around 15 to 16, and I it was genuinely the most frightening experience I've ever had point me, and 3 to 4 other guys were in the mall, which is a 15 minute drive outside the city. It is located in a remote commercial slash industrial area with all sorts of furniture stock houses etc. To get there by bus, you get off at the bus depot next to a huge IP and a go-kart track, walk along a semi-abandoned road that goes through some creepy properties, and finally reach the backside of the mall. As we return down the creepy road to catch the last bus, I started getting weird vibes. I shared the though with my best buddy, and he felt the same, but we attributed it to the setting, so we joked about how we would have to fight of a horde of zombies. The other guys overheard, and they said something along the lines of no one would be stupid enough to go against us. Truly, my best friend and the other guys were on the same basketball team, think 4 muscular dudes hovering around the 190cm mark and little me was a martial artist with competitive experience and a strong kickboxing background. As we reached the vast, almost empty parking lot, the feeling intensified. The usual don't be a bussy banter ensued, when suddenly one of my friends said what's that over, guys run point I didn't even look forward, we just turned around, and Usain bolted it towards the cart track, which was closing down. I could hear a pandemonium of yelling, and the menacing revving of a dirt bike. I only looked behind, when we made it, about 20 guys with chains in their hands and their faces covered with shemigs were after us. Before I could make sense of the situation, the track owner came out with a faking shotgun and shot at the air. The group scattered, and made for the trees, and we quickly called the police. Meanwhile, the owner's son got in a cart, and scouted the area, only to be chased by the dirt bike, and barely made it back, it was a small distance. An hour, really, later. Two patrol cars came, one looked around for the disappeared horde and the other parked outside the cart, the officer exited with his gun drawn and pointed at the owner who still held onto his shotgun. Luckily, he was calm enough to drop it and get on the ground until we explained the situation to the officer. They kindly escorted us back home. Two point the next day, I read a local news article about the incident. Apparently, three of them attempted to assault a 20-year-old girl. She luckily made it to her scooter and hit the main road. Police thought they were a group of an anarchist group who chased people and faked them up for sheets and giggles, and two of them had even done time for gang rap and attempted murder. My first year of college I lived 20 minutes by train from New York City and was there every weekend. 
I was walking down the street with my best friend high on life and part lol it's about 3am on a Saturday and we are heading to Penn Station to sleep on the seats before the morning NJ transit opens, but the street is like dead. Probably the only place in New York you can hear a pin drop point I suddenly get this crazy shiver down my spine and stop listening to my friend and start focusing on my surroundings. That's when I hear the footsteps behind us. I tell my friend to keep talking, but to pull out her pepper spray. She did and I pulled out a switchblade my brother gave me, that I carry with me everywhere. We are supposed to make a left at the next corner, but my spidey senses were on fire that night, because I told my friend to cross the street, and make a right instead. As we near the opposite corner, of where we were supposed to go the man behind us quickens his pace. I turn around quickly and slightly charge at him brandishing my knife and spraying the pepper spray screaming at him to fuck right off. He jumped back and turned right around and walked straight toward two men just out of sight just standing there waiting at the corner we were supposed to turn at. I grabbed my friend by the arm and hauled our ass out of there, walked into the nearest bodega and called the police and an Uber. Police took our info and called to follow up a few days later. Turns out there had been a string of gang raps in that area for the last few months. I went into the police station with my friend and gave them all the info we had and even worked with a sketch artist for the guy we chased off. Craziest experience of my life. I don't know whatever happened to the case, but I know that one. Ladies, never go anywhere alone too. Listen to your gut. I promise you you're right 3. Always carry defense weapons with you. That is pepper spray, knife, blinding light 4. If you're low on options, don't wait for them to attack you. Call them the fuck out at the top of your lungs and tell them to fuck right off. Their game is power meaning in real life they are most likely faking society's garbage. Make yourself big and scary and scare them off. Prove to them what they already know about themselves, their massive pusses. They don't want too much work. Make them faking work for it. Ugh worst part is I ignored my gut both times was walking home after a silly argument with my boyfriend. Decided to take the scenic route by the river so I could look at trees and water to cool off. I noticed two sketchy looking dudes up ahead but thought to myself that I didn't want to stereotype and if something happened there was a street to their right that I could run up through. I took out my phone and started replying to a message from my boyfriend. I noticed the grey cap dude went around my left, while the white cap dude went to my right. Immediately gripped my phone and bag, and looked up to see grey cap grabbing my phone. I wasn't sure where white cap went, but pretty sure he was pulling my bag from behind, since I could feel tension on the straps. At this point I started screaming like a banshee. Like a constant ah, my voice is pretty loud, so I was mostly hoping it would freak them out. Dude kept a tight grip on my phone, so I used my leg to kick him in the elbow of the arm holding my phone. He shouted fuck, and we both dropped my phone. I grabbed it, still screaming by the way, and darted down the aforementioned street. My gut told me they were sketchy, but my dumber's brain told me not to stereotype point one time. While I was doing work placement, I was visiting my old housemates. About 2am I'm still up, and get a message from a guy I happened to have a crush on. But something was a bit off, but I couldn't place my finger on what. He asks to come over, and I'm like yup. Knock on the door, and it's his friend slash housemate who I had a sheety one night stand with the year before. I was like why are you here? And he replies um, I messaged you? And I clarify that he messaged me on his friend's facebook. book. I won't get into the nitty gritty, but he spends the next hour or so badgering me for such saying the usual sheet of oh it'll be quick, and we did it before, what difference does it make now? He came after 20 seconds, and it was sore, and not at all pleasurable, but I was trying to be nice by simply saying I wasn't in the mood. Long story short he raps me, and bolts almost immediately point moral of the stories, trust your gut. I've posted a different story, but my strongest guy feeling story was of the time I'm sure I just avoided, being murdered due to a gut instinct at a night out at a rod little, place that was kinda like a coffee shop but nothing was licensed, and it was in a warehouse, and they sold homemade ales and beers they bought of locals under the bar, it was kinda trendy but hippy dippy, a nice place to be for the most part point it was in an old print works building. 
downstairs was the cafe slash club, then up the stairs there were artist studios and the layer above that was small flats. I had a security license at the time and did free door work for them when they needed it, it was off the books and it was more I was the designated person to be the first to deal with trouble point, so this weird band has played and this woman has shown people some very odd art and this guy has wandered in drunk after becoming interested in the people there enjoying themselves and he was drinking straight vodka out of a bottle point his name, Slasher. That tipped me off. But what do I do with this truly quite scary really very drunk man when he hasn't yet caused issues? We resolved to watch him and act as the situation required, but we expected trouble point he was aggressively hitting on the girl who'd shown her art and wouldn't leave her the fuck alone. I noticed this, went over and excused her saying I needed to settle up with her. There was nothing to settle up and tried to get her away from him quietly and without fuss, but he wouldn't have it and tried physically restraining her by grabbing her arm. I smacked his arm out of the way, shoved her behind me, and backed up to block, and then closed the odd sliding door that luckily only had a small panel of glass as he lost it when I slammed the door and smashed the glass trying to force entry. I shouted for the staff to rush her out the back whilst me and a bloke who'd noticed what was going on helped me hold the door shut pointy rather than leaving bolted up the creepiest metal stairs into the dark. I didn't know this. I thought he'd left and no one told me so a bit later I'm guarding the girl whilst she waits for a friend to come collect her, she wanted a ciggy, so I went out with her, and she'd not long let it when pane window from the workshop above smashed outwards, and I saw Slasher backing away a large hammer in hand point, as soon as I saw the glass falling I was running her back inside, and into the kitchen and finally the manager agreed to call the police point I rounded up three guys and asked them to help me go see if we could figure out where the dude had gone. I'd never been into the workshop before and it was a massive open space to begin but separated into all wood constructed sections which made it an utter rabbit warren. We saw lights on in part of the studio which brought me to the realization that sheet people are still here working. So we go in, I quickly explain and go office to studio asking them to lock their doors. I was unaware of the apartments as I didn't work for them, so I didn't warn them, the off the books security helping out came after this, and I wasn't paid, so it's hardly like I knew the place well point we came back into the area right not wanted to explore prior, where the window had been broken, and I felt sudden crushing unease, I knew I was being watched, I called out for the dude. Saying it would be best if he left as the police were being called, shouting for a dude named Slasher and asking him to be reasonable as surreal laugh. I walked closer and saw that the massive as hammer that had been on the bench near the broken window was gone. I'd seen it when I first came upstairs, big as metal working heavy hammer. I knew he was near me and closing and I turned around and told the guys as calm as I could that we are gonna leave now and check downstairs which obviously makes no sense. One guy started to argue then his eyes caught mine and saw the look on my face and we quick paced downstairs. The owner had still not called the cops despite my constant pleas and said they weren't going to, illegal liquor and all that, no proof he is still even here ECT ECT. 5 slash 10 minutes later a whole host of cop cars pull up outside and a group of highly serious looking coppers went blazing up the stairs slash I had knocked on the door of the flats until someone had answered I don't remember the bullshit excuse he gave them now but he asked to use their phone and they obliged but he then came inside sat on their sofa pulled out the hammer and started telling them about how he was satan sent to take their souls and end their lives and I don't know the details of how they called the police, but he had managed to use a fire exit to escape the police, but I think they caught him shortly after, if I recall right point, that dude blamed me directly for him not getting to sexually harass and honestly I think his intent was to wrap her from his many attempts to get her away from the group and his aggression and violence towards. Her I've never felt quite like I was one footstep away from being murdered quite like that, and I have so many stories from my life I could easily share here. It's a wonder I'm alive still. In October of 2000 my mom decided to let us three kids, me being the youngest at five, draw murals on our trailer wall. I'm not a very creative person, so I just drew some military stuff. I drew some tanks in a desert, a plane, and two towers with one plane going straight into the tower. 
Now I don't want to say I predicted 9 over 11, but it was weird to say the least. We didn't think anything of it at the time, but a few years later my sister remembered what I had drawn, and so to make sure it was as we remember we went to the people we sold the trailer to. They painted overall but my mural as they too thought it was crazy that a child would paint that point in July of 2002 I had a crazy dream that my mom was going to go to a place down from a hill to buy something and the cops were going to raid that house. I woke up in terror and anxiety and rushed to the living room to find my mom getting ready to leave. I begged her to stay and not go or something bad was going to happen. Of course she did not believe me and went anyways. Two hours later my mom would be arrested during a drug bust and go to prison for four years. The cops were sitting on top of the hill watching point I've had a long history of deja vu and being able to remember sequences of events from dreams that happened just days before. Sometimes important sometimes mundane conversations. I've tried to change the sequence events and sometimes I don't. Doesn't seem to affect anything point trust your kids people they tend to be more open and receptive to the things we aren't. Almost being kidnapped by my mom point in January of 2012, my sister and I ran away from my mother. At the time we lived on the west coast of Norway, and we ran away to our dad at the south coast, a rate plus hours drive away from dear mother anyway, my mom was bipolar and a drug addict, and we had the worst childhood imaginable. Without going too much into details, I'll just say that it's the kinda jaw-dropping situation you only hear about in movies just a couple of days after we ran away, my mom went to court against my dad for kidnapping. The court case went on for almost a year, but in the end she lost, and we got to live with my dad. She still has parental rights over me, which means she has to sign any legal papers that requires both parents. Anyway, during Easter break, March slash April 2012, my sister and I was home alone. We sat in the living room playing video games. The entrance door led right into the living room, so we had no entrance hallway. As we sat and played games, I got this really bad gut feeling. I could just feel that something was off. I was, and still am, very paranoid. After the bad feeling lingered for a little while, I decided to get up and lock the door. Not even before I reached the sofa again, the door handle was violently pushed down. No knock, no hello, just someone trying to rip the door open point scared out of my mind. I look out the window, and lo and behold, it's my mother, looking furious. We run upstairs to my room, lock that door too, and open the window. My mom is screaming for us to get out and come with her etc. We called our dad and he somehow managed to get her away and drive all the 8 hours back while we cried on the floor. We later was told that she had come to our house knowing that we were home alone with the intention of bringing us back. We weren't allowed to be outside by ourselves and had to be driven to school and stay inside all the time for a good month. So she couldn't snatch us had it not been for my gut feeling. I don't at you know where I would be today. I live in a big student dorm that's square, with quite a big courtyard in the middle. Four entrances to the dorms and two gates where you can get onto the courtyard, and which face out to the road passing by the front of the building. The entrance that I use to get to my dorm is in one of these gates, the biggest one. Being as it is a dorm in a country where weed is legal and booze is an intrinsic part of student culture, we see a lot of weird shit happening in our building. From errant snakes prowling the courtyard to a dude getting lost and making himself at home in a random girl's bed and falling asleep there. So one night, late October, I come home around 3 o'clock in the morning, put my bike away and start heading upstairs when I see a girl in her jammies and a plaid and barefoot shuffling about in the snow in the courtyard. Initially I think she was looking for her keys or something, as she kept her head down and was moving slowly, and I didn't pay it too much mind until I saw her shuffling out through the gate and towards the street. I'm ashamed to say it took me a minute to make up my mind to go after her. But I ended up following after her and trying to get her attention. She was non-responsive initially, seemed unaware that I was even there, and kept wandering on to the point where I tried to physically detain her while trying to figure out what was going on. 
it ended up taking three passers by to stop her from wandering off into the night point turns out after we called an ambulance and she had an absolute meltdown about it that she had a dissociative personality disorder we were incredibly lucky that her housemate heard the ruckus and came out because the ambulance people thought she was tripping balls the weird thing about me though is that I don't get sick often, and when I do I don't show much symptoms, nor do I get fevers. We took my temperature and I didn't have a fever at the time, which was kind of expected. But nonetheless, I still took it easy that weekend. I went to school on Tuesday, I did not have school on Monday, and my symptoms progressively got worse as the day went on. I went to the nurse to ask to sleep on one of the cots, but they had to take my temperature beforehand. I sign in, they take my temp, and it's 103 degrees. I'm forced home, because according to federal law I'm unfit to attend school. I cancel my date A plans with my girlfriend at the time and headed home. Into the night I started hacking up bloody phlegm, and spitting it into a cup. My parents at this point, have made an appointment with the doc for 10 tomorrow morning. I head to bed early Wednesday, February 21st. 2018, I woke up in a gross sweat at like 1am. I was short of breath and my chest was heavy point I was heavy point I propped myself up to a seated position and nearly fainted when I did. To try and explain the feeling every time I entered an upright position my head felt like what a static TV screen looks like, and I slowly lose vision and consciousness. I tried calling for my parents, but to no surprise they didn't answer. I bit the bullet, and walked to their room, and collapsed on their bed. They suggested I took a bath because 1. I apparently smelled hideous, even though I showered 5 hours prior and 2. It could help wake me up. I draw a bath, and learned that I could stand, so long as I'm bent over a counter. I did the good old toe test, it seemed nice and warm. The moment I'm submerged I damn near pass out. I leap out, laid on the floor naked, and called for my parents. This time they answered. My dad got me dressed, and brought me to his bed. He told me this lesson, you have two options, you can go to the air right now, if you think it's that serious, or we can wait 7 more hours, until we go to the doctor. The first thing, that stuck out to me in that moment, was how fast 2 hours flew by. I might have passed out in the tub, or on the floor, not sure. But at first I was thinking of not going to the air, because of my family's financial situation at the time. But my caveman alarm system went off, and made me think I was gonna die, if I didn't go to the air. So I chose to go to the air point, when I got there my blood pressure was scarily low, 60 over 80 if I remember correctly. My oxygen was low and my heartbeat, was very fast as well. They couldn't treat me at the hospital I went to, so I was flown to Laura's Children's Hospital in Chicago via helicopter. They put me on paralytics. But since my blood pressure was so low they couldn't put enough sedatives on me until I was at Lori's. But my eyes were glued shut and I couldn't move. But I could feel the tube being shoved down my throat and the air flowing, even though I'm not breathing. It wasn't fun. I wake up on Friday and I got notified that I had septic shock and pneumonia. My lungs and kidneys have failed while my heart was on the verge of it. They still don't know what bacteria caused the septic shock and doc said I had a 10% of survival and that, if I didn't come, when I did then I would have been gone without a doubt. Even an hour more. Now I'm 16 years old and fully recovered. But it was a close one though I'm not gonna lie. I'm really late to the party, but fuck it, why not point my whole family have always had really strong instincts. My siblings and I came from a long line of witches, so I have a lot of stories. I'll stick to a few that made me realize to never question when they hit one, around age 18 to 19. I was walking on a sidewalk with my at the time girlfriend. It was about 2 to 3 in the morning just going around to play Pokemon Go. Everything in the city is pretty dead. Out of nowhere something in me was screaming at me move her away from the road so I did. I made her walk very close to a parking lot we were close to. She had already known, when I get like that, to not even question what I said and do it. A very specific walk pattern came to me, walk faster for a moment, slow down, then hop in the parking lot altogether, and stop moving entirely. I heard a car behind us a lot farther than I could normally hear, 
when it got close and started to pass us, the car swerved off the road and missed where I felt the need to change jar walk pattern. Hit the side of the sidewalk and came to a stop. After making sure he was alright, we called for an emergency response team. I grabbed her hand and bolted home to, age 13 to 14, was riding in the car with my mom. Something snapped in both of us at the same time. We just looked at each other and knew that something was very wrong with the person in the car behind us. We flagged them down and we pulled into the parking lot of the fire station. Thankfully the person followed. We got to the window and a little old lady rolled it down. We struck up a small conversation to ask if she was alright. She said she was feeling kind of dizzy, but that she was okay. Got one of the firefighters to come out and give her a look over just to be sure. Had an ambulance roll up soon after, and they read her blood sugar, she was a diabetic, and getting close to the danger zone. Went and picked up something small for her to eat, while the emergency crew stayed behind with her. After getting a little food in her, mom called up her family and let them know where she was and what happened. Her daughter came to the scene, so mom and I left 3, age 11 to 12. The very first time I knew I could never leave that calling unanswered. Also the one that hits me the hardest whenever I think about it, so this one will have a lot more detail than the other two. A little context, my grandmother had lived with my mom since I was about a year or two old. She was getting up there in age, but was still mostly independent. She didn't drive, so it was easier for mom to take care of her when she got sick, got her meds, ECT. When I was about 11 or so, she had a stroke and we as a family helped with her in-home hospice care. Mom took most of it upon herself as she did patient slash hospice care before a couple car crashes that left her in too much pain to continue it as a profession. We live in the backwash of a sheet state, dear everywhere, after grandma passed, something in her turned in my mom. She was in a deep depression. Brother and sister were rarely home, and mom kept sending me to our neighbor's house to play with my friends and stay the night more often than not. One night we were going to have another sleepover at their house. I had already made a blanket bed so both of my friends and I could sleep in the living room. Their mom was talking to them in the background, so I was going to sit down on the blanket bed. While on my hands and knees about to transition to sitting, I stopped dead in my tracks. I locked in place and had no control over it. A deep pit in my stomach formed out of nowhere. It felt hollow, hurt, made me feel like the entire room was spinning, and made me start crying all at once. I didn't know why I started crying, I knew it didn't come directly from the pain in my stomach, but it was easy to hide in the partially darkened room. When I was finally able to sit down, the instant Myers hit the floor I got a pounding headache that made my entire body shake like a leaf. It was worse than any migraine I ever had before, and I had been hospitalized for them 4 or 5 times at that point. I know it doesn't sound like it makes much sense, but it was like the headache itself was screaming at me, go the fuck home. It looped and looped over and over. It echoed in my own head, and started playing over itself to the point I couldn't even make out the words anymore. It turned into a high-pitched screeching, kind of like when you've had a very loud noise blasted in your ear for a while. Every bit of strength I had drained in an instant and I nearly fell over. My vision blurred and everything around me slowed down. I could see the movement of everyone, kind of like if I could see every single frame of an animation light boxed in a row. Then it went silent. Everything. I couldn't hear my friend's mom talking, the TV in the background, or the phrase that had tormented me. Then my vision cut out completely. I was in a pure void. There were walls around me, but none at the same time. Floating in an endless void, but still confined in a small space. Couldn't hear, couldn't see, but pure instinct guided me through that void as I wandered around. This went on for what felt like days. Didn't even feel like I existed in the same realm anymore. But in an instant everything came back to me. The TV picked up exactly at the moment I last remembered seeing it. Friend's mom started talking again, and time reverted back to normal. I got a burst of energy I to this day have never felt again. Above everything around me, I heard one word. Run. It only rang out once, but I could not ignore it. In a hurry, I told friend's mom I had to go home, then bolted out. I ran faster than I thought I ever could with my stumpy legs. I guess one of my friends followed me, because not too long after I got inside. 
She slinked her way in. My mom was sitting on the couch, her head was leaned back, as if she was trying to sleep. I called to her from the doorway to tell her I was home, but she didn't respond. My heart was pounding faster and harder than ever before. I had to make sure she knew I was there, so I paced over and shook her a little and repeated myself. She opened her eyes for a minute, groaned, then leaned back, shook her again. Same response. Then I knew something was really wrong, it wasn't just me being paranoid. I had my friend go back in my room, close the door, cover her ears, and not come out no matter what. I started screaming at this woman. She didn't even look like my mom at that point. She was pale and flopping her head like a cat in a deep sleep. I swear the whole neighborhood could have heard me screaming. Called for emergency services and kept trying to keep her focus on me for more than a few seconds at the time. I heard my friend in the room screaming and crying, not having a clue what was going on. After what felt like an eternity, an ambulance came and took her away. I was sitting outside sobbing into my hands for I don't even know how long. But eventually my sister happened to be pulling back in the driveway with a few friends. I screamed and cried then ran to her. She hugged me and I started explaining what happened. I don't remember even getting through that first sentence point I blacked out for a little longer than a week. I don't really remember the specifics. When I was finally somewhat myself again, I was sitting at my estranged father's house. Hadn't seen him in about a year or so at that point. It made no sense, I came right out of that moment standing in the driveway, clinging to my sister for dear life, to sitting in the home of a man who was more of an acquaintance than my blood. I went to find him, and asked him what happened. He looked surprised to see me, at all which made no sense seeing as I was in his living room. He said I hadn't talked the entire time I was there. He started explaining everything that happened. The answers I needed were given to me, but my mom tried to kill herself that night in an overdose point she's fine now years later, and I'm so thankful point, if I had ignored that feeling, if I even had the ability to, she wouldn't be here today. My mom and I are very close now after a few years of past bad blood before that night. Every day I have with her, I can't help but smile, even on my worst days, if you read any of this, thank you. I don't get to talk about any of these things often, because it comes off as crazy, and I know that point tldr, never, ever, ignore that feeling. If you hear that scream from a place you can't even pinpoint, don't you faking, dare turn away from it. A little different, but still my gut instinct. Backstory you need to know, is that I have very strong feelings about not taking medication unless absolutely necessary, and because of that and other reasons, I'm very against epidurals during labor. All my friends know me as the natural birth friend and everyone I know always comes to me with questions about it, because everyone knows how passionate I'm about it point. So I was pregnant with my second child, and the third trimester comes around, and I started having thoughts like why do I need to feel the pain of labor again, and just basically not feeling passionate about natural birth at all. Very strange for me, but I blamed it on me being depressed and not exactly happy to be pregnant. I push it to the back of my mind and continue with my birth plan for a non-medicated birth, and so all of my care providers know that's what I want. Day of my baby's birth comes, and labor is different. Not normal at all. Baby was sunny side up, so I didn't know this at the time, but my tailbone is breaking as he's moving down. Obviously very painful, I can't even feel the contractions. So I get the epidural. And because of that they have to put in forth in my arm, which is keeping my vein open so to speak, because they're giving me fluids through it. More slight complications come up but eventually baby comes out healthy and happy. I held him and breastfed him, and then I start to bleed out. I lost over 3 liters of blood. I was minutes away from dying. But because I got the epidural, I had pain relief, so I didn't have to feel the doctor scraping my uterus out with her hand or the DNC tool she used. They didn't have to spend time, while I'm still bleeding, putting me under for the surgery I had to have. And all of my veins collapsed, except the one they had the eye in, so they were able to give me blood to replace all I had lost. So basically if I hadn't listened to my gut telling me something was different, and I needed to get the epidural, I might be dead. If I had given birth the way I thought was right I'd be dead. I mean right for me, I don't judge anyone based on how they give birth. 
My BFF had been married to her husband for 10 years. They appeared to be happy and stable. They would goof around a lot. Once we had a group of friends all hanging out at their house. My BFF was putting her sock clad foot in her husband's face and telling him to smell it. I know that sounds weird, but it was the kind of thing they did all the time and also was a goofy game they played with their foster kids. The kids would request their feet be smelt and the parents would pretend to eat the feet. I don't know why. Parenting makes you a whole new person. Anyway, when my BFF offered her foot to her husband, he growled like a dog and actually bit down on it, with the kids they would mime the biting and eating, but not really bite, and shook it back and forth. No one else seemed to notice, but I've known her, since we were teens, and I could tell he bit down really hard, enough to hurt. She played it off really well, and laughed like it was a joke, but I could tell he was being genuinely aggressive. Point six months later he left her. She was being unreasonable, because she was not letting him bring a second wife into the marriage. I have nothing against being poly, but this was something very much against the established boundaries of their relationship, and he just sprang this on her out of the blue. Apparently he'd been cheating on her with wife number two point after the dust settled I asked her about the foot thing. I hadn't ever asked before because how would I even bring that up? What could I say? But after the divorce it was easier, and she confirmed that it was indeed painful, and it was him lashing out at her she divorced his ass and met someone better. They've been married 10 plus years and have 6 adopted kids together. This was a few years ago and some assholes at work used to tease me about it, but I think it is a pretty relevant experience point I was walking home at like 0030 on a weeknight after having met a friend at a pub and having had a few drinks. I wasn't drunk, but just buzzy and listening to my music when I turn left to walk down the lane towards the marina I live in. I live on a canal boat and my marina is down a lane off of main road. There was a guy walking on the other side of the road to the junction I just turned off of. He was about the same age as me and wearing clean clothes. As I crossed the road to get to the pavement he called hey mate, have you got any Rizless? I politely said I didn't and continued walking. We passed each other and he asked if I'd had a good evening. I said I had and that I had hoped he had too. He then starts offering me sexual favors and say I'm not interested. He tells me he is B. I say I'm not fussed, but that I'm not interested. Eventually we shake hands. Why? And we turn our separate ways. I'm a little uneasy about it so take my phone out and put in 999 ready to call it if anything else happens. Once I've walked about 50 meters down the road to the foot of a bridge that goes over the canal I look over my shoulder and I can see that he is jogging down the road towards me again shouting out for me to wait for him. I keep walking up the bridge, and at the crest I look back again. At this point I see an Audi hatchback has come round the corner, and pulled up next to the guy, and he is getting into the passenger side door. I dial 999, and jog down the other side of the bridge hoping to get to a pub, that is on the canal on the other side. Obviously they are shut, because it's 1am on a weeknight, so my next thought is to get to the marina, where I know there is a camera looking over the gate, though I later found out this didn't record footage. It was only a live feed to the office. As I start running down the road towards my marina I hear the car come over the bridge and this guy is shouting out the window for me to wait for him. When they see that I'm on the phone they screech to a halt, and do a three point turn, and race back over the bridge. The dispatch officer kept offering to send a car to me, but I turned them down once I was inside the marina, but thinking about it now, if they had come they may have passed the car on their way. I have no idea what they were after, but I'm still so angry with myself for not getting the number plate, and that they probably still haven't been caught. Last September I was in England as an exchange student. For about a week, I was 14 at the time, and on our way back to Germany, in the bus with a ton of my friends, laughing and joking around, I suddenly got this really bad feeling, like something was terribly terribly wrong. It was around 1pm, and I didn't think much of it. Then my mom texted me, asking when we would arrive at my school, which was a bit weird, because as far as I knew, she should have been at home in Hungary, and my dad was supposed to pick me up in the evening. I again didn't think much of it, but half an hour later, my teacher came to the back where I was sitting, 
to tell me that when we arrived, we needed to talk. That was the point when I knew something was really off here. I got dizzy and sick to the stomach, and it just got worse and worse as we were closer and closer to our town. I was panicking because I thought I was in some kind of trouble, even if I didn't do anything wrong. While the exchange lasted, I have a history of underage drinking and more of that kind of stuff. When we arrived, late at night, I got off of the bus, and my teacher told me to follow her. Suddenly there were my godparents and a random guy in some kind of uniform. I couldn't make out properly in the dark, and I sheet you not I thought it was a police officer, and I'm really faked now. They asked me to go inside of the school with them, I remind you, in the middle of the night, and I was asking my godparents where my sister and my dad were at, who were supposed to pick me up, and they told me they were home. When we all settled down in the aula of the school, I was told that my dad died because of a heart attack around 1pm. As a grade school student, I was profoundly Christian. Since it was making others proud of me, I found a lot and found a lot of my happiness and worth in being a very active member of my youth ministry. In around middle school, I was told one too many times to stay away from non-believers or that I might be tempted to stray from the straight and narrow. I started getting a really fishy feeling that my church was not as happy as I thought it was, nor as accepting as they claimed they to be. I was really bothered by the fact that they answered my questions about the nature of God with humans, can't understand perfection through our imperfection. Eventually I decided to take a small break from the church to investigate other options and see if there were more convincing denominations or religions or anything point my parents forced me into a small prayer room in the church and basically told me that they would never accept this type of sin in their daughter. Over the next few years, dozens of other members quit that church. I myself was eventually told to stop coming to church altogether, blessing in disguise. Turns out my church is basically as close to a cult as you can get without dipping into the seriously whack sheet. Several other former members who tried to leave basically got disowned over it, with the full backing of the church. Many people here can probably relate to this, and I still feel the after effects of this huge fallout at times. A few family members and I had planned to go to Russia as a vacation as we had always wanted to visit, and we often travel to different places around the globe. We had booked the tickets, but I then got a strange feeling over me, as if this was detrimental to my future for whatever reason. Although the feeling was strong, I hesitated to say anything about it as the tickets had already been booked, and I wished to prevent any panic I could have imbued them with. Miraculously, my brother also had a feeling that something was not right or that something was going to go wrong at some point. He told me this and I also expressed how I felt toward the situation too. We decided to tell our parents as it seemed the only logical thing we thought to do in this scenario and they too had a very peculiar feeling about the trip, a feeling they couldn't describe but just one that didn't settle right, a very unpleasant feeling in their gut. Ultimately, they decided to cancel the trip altogether to avoid any paranoia whilst we was out there as they knew we wouldn't be able to enjoy the vacation if we were worrying about this bizarre feeling we all had about it. Turns out, the plane that we booked was the same plane that got struck by a lightning bolt and crashed, leaving everyone on board petrified and unable to enjoy their holidays as they had to make an emergency landing and had to book another flight. What I've learned from this is, always have faith in your gut feelings, they could save lives. I was 13 years old babysitting my mum's co-worker's daughter while they went to a training session. I took her to the park with their dog point as I'm pushing her on the swings I see this older guy walk down towards the park, coming in from the same forest trail we came in. He didn't seem weird or anything, but my stomach sank instantly. He walked past us and sat on a set of bleachers facing the opposite direction of us. No one else was at the park, just me, the girl and him point, so he's sitting with his back facing us, but he kept turning around to look at us for a few seconds then turn away. This happened a few times and I started to get really freaked out and was like okay fuck it, we're out. But the only way out that was closest to the busy street and where people would be made us have to walk right past him. It was that, or we go back through a forest trail and I didn't want to be in a situation where we were secluded and not in the open. I was terrified point, 
so I grab the girl's hand and the dog and start speed walking past him. I look over and he's masturbating point I yelled, run to the girl and we sprinted out of there. Thankfully there was a group of older people smoking outside the front of a building that backs onto the park. I ran to them and told them what was happening and two of the people start calling the cops and walking towards the park and then the masturbating guy walks from the park exit we took out onto the street. They pinned him to the ground and waited for the cops to come and arrest him and they hid me and the girl inside their warehouse so we didn't have to see him again point we found out after he was arrested that he lived near my mom's kawaka who I was babysitting for and he followed us to the park. I didn't even notice, I felt like a full point anyways this was long, but super creepy, and I should have instantly left when I felt my stomach sink. It was a dark and stormy night, a brown haired man with short somewhat curly hair, and standing about 5 minutes and 11 seconds tall came in, to eat by himself at a small expensive French restaurant I was working at during college point the restaurant was located in a rural densely wooded area that was far away from most other businesses, but there were a lot of vacation properties nearby point I was working as the only waiter that night point his mannerisms were a little strange, in that they seemed like affectations. He spoke as if he was trying to come across as especially sophisticated and very intelligent. I have no doubt that he was fairly intelligent, but it was obvious that he wanted me to be impressed by him. Point he had a five course meal and ordered the most expensive food and drink we had. Point Caesar salad, soup, escargot, caviar, filet mignon, lobster, cream brawley, old single malt scotch, champagne. Point it was a slow weeknight and towards the end of his main course he was already the only person left eating at a table. Point there were a couple of people at the bar as well but the tables are in a separate room from the bar he was continually making conversation and asking me ceaseless questions about myself. He was also flattering me with lots of compliments I had no feelings about him one way or the other beyond finding him a little odd and pretentious. I couldn't have cared less that he was trying to impress me or make friends with me point I was a very good and personable waiter so he probably thought he was successfully ingratiating himself with me point he brought the conversation on to the topic of music and when I told him that I liked jazz he excitedly told me that he had worked at a radio station and had rescued a bunch of valuable old real tape jazz recordings and LPs from being thrown in the trash. He wanted me to take possession of them so that I could give them to my college's radio station point in order to do that I needed to go out with him to his car I told him that I couldn't leave while I was working, which was somewhat true, but what was even more true was that I just didn't want to go out to his car with him point I thought that there was a possibility that he was gay and that this was his way of coming on to me or part of his plan for making a pass at me. Nothing is wrong with being gay of course. I just happened to be straight point he tried several times to get me to go with him out to his car. He said he didn't have room to store the recordings and emphasized how much of a shame it would be if he ended up having to throw them away. He suggested I might even be able to sell them point I didn't care about selling them but I almost went out with him to his car just to get him to shut up about it. I figured if he made a pass at me I would just tell him I wasn't gay. I don't mind if a gay man makes a pass at me as long as he respects my boundaries after tell him I'm not interested point but because of a gut feeling I had I ultimately decided I wouldn't go with him to his car though point my rational mind was saying it was probably no big deal if I just did what he wanted but my gut was saying oh hell no point I brought him the check and after inspecting his wallet he said he needed to go out to his car to retrieve his checkbook point he Went outside, got in his car, and immediately drove away at high speed skipping out on the bill. It was a 350 plus bill point I told the bartender to call the police. The police said that they would immediately send an officer to the restaurant point this surprised us because they would typically just take the information down over the phone, especially since the restaurant is located out of the way from most other places. When the police got there they asked me to describe the man point then they showed me a picture and asked me if it was the same man point it was the man was wanted as an arsonist for having burned down half. A dozen buildings he had recently escaped from jail point he was also wanted for questioning in the recent assault and attempted kidnapping of another man. 
he had recently done the dine and dash at a different expensive restaurant in the state and the police had identified him through security camera footage. They were quickly following up with all reports of people doing dine and dash in hopes that he would do it again and they would catch him point I told them what car he was driving point they surrounded the area and put up roadblocks they caught him point tldr. I narrowly avoided going out into the dark alone with a psychopath to his car where he would have almost definitely have tried to kill me or hurt me and kidnap me and then who knows what. This was when I was a child, between 7 and 10, if I recall correctly point my family had been going to the same church for a while. It was a city over from where we lived and somehow my mom ended up always bringing our friends too. Mom isn't super religious per se, it was more like she gave a damn and people would dump their kids on her. Anyways, this man became our new church photographer for whatever reason and I just didn't like him at all. It was more than avoid him. I would deliberately ruin any photo I knew he was taking of myself, my siblings, or my friends. I pushed my best friend through the swinging doors to the bathroom level ruin them. It was considered extremely out if character for me and I was repeatedly told to cut it out point turns out that man was a convicted bedophile that the church higher ups wanted to give a second chance since he had only been caught with images not actually abusing anyone. When that came out, many of the church members were absolutely livid, my grandma and mom especially point my mom apologized to me and told me she would trust if I said I didn't like someone in the future. Happened one more time when I was a teen. An uncle by marriage just creeped me out. Like, hide other people from this guy. I couldn't figure out why exactly because the warning bells felt different than the ones for the bedophile. Eventually there was a falling out in the family that meant we didn't see this guy anymore point a couple years later said uncle by marriage beat his brother to death with a baseball bat and left his body under an overpass over a cigarette. I started talking to this guy when I was in high school we'll call him see I always had a bad view about him. He would always tell me how much he liked me but never asked me out. He insisted on meeting my parents. In all honesty I didn't like him, but when I told him I didn't want him to come over he came over anyway. He literally would show up where I was. This one time I really needed a ride home from school, and he had skipped that day to hang out with a female friend. He said he could still get me home I had a bad feeling, but it was okay he ended up not even showing up. I told him that night that I was definitely not into him, but it was nothing personal. He kept calling me after that. He also would go out to clubs every night get faked up, he had a fake it, and call me. I was not cool with this, I told him, after he tried to emotionally manipulate me into continuing to talk to him that I was lesbian, I'm not but this is the only thing that worked, so I don't feel all that bad. About 4 months later I started dating my current boyfriend, and he is an absolutely amazing person. I feel so lucky to have him. He has never been anything but good to me. We've lasted for quite a while now, and things look good. So see if you're reading this you're a faking creep edit. Sorry for typus my phone is really stupid. Not my gut, but my mom's, as her gut is much more in tune to bad situations I'm a bit of a night owl, and she knows this, and for a while my brother had a job where he would often work really late, however, he didn't have a license or his own car yet, so whenever he had late nights, I would pick him up. My mom knows this, and that if I'm not home past 10 to 11, it means I either went to go pick up my brother, or am at a friend's house. She'd only ever know I'd be gone, because she would wake up, to go to the bathroom and find my room empty and dark. One night she woke up a little before midnight, and saw I wasn't there, again she figured I was either at a friend's, or picking up my brother, but apparently in single minute she was in the bathroom, with the door open mind you, and I didn't come back. She, for some reason she can't even think to rationalize, she started to panic, grabbed her phone, and called me to immediately ask where I was. I told her, I'm picking up my brother, but he's running super late, so I was hanging out at warm at being watched over by the staff. That didn't settle her nerves and she demanded that she text me the instant my brother was ready to pick up, me picking him up, leaving to go home, etc etc. I thought she was being dramatic, but then a creepy guy sat next to me and kept talking about my purse brand and seemingly left. 
A few minutes later she texted me asking if I was picking him up yet. I told her no, he hasn't said anything to me, and that I would text her once he did. Immediately after I replied back to her the employees told me that that man was wandering around the parking lot, looking through all the windows on the cars. And since they overheard him talking about my purse, they offered to escort me to my car thankfully I parked close, and as soon as I got to my car my brother got FF work, so I left like a bullet. A couple days later I found out that that man was later arrested for mugging someone at gunpoint, as well as burglary. It, it was a trip. The city I used to live in recently has smaller vans along with buses for the same distance as the bus system runs, colloquially referred to as travelers. I'd always gotten a weird feeling from them, on a bus, you still have some leg room, while these travelers just made me feel kinda claustrophobic even looking at them, because of how cramped up they seemed from the inside, and I really wasn't interested in someone's crotch brushing my face as they passed to get a seat. I was heading back home a bit later than usual from work one evening when a completely empty traveler pulls up at the bus stop, unheard of in India, where they're usually crammed to the hilt within minutes, and the driver yells out the destination. I decide it's better waiting a bit longer for a bus and watch it leave, noticing a very distinctive rainbow pattern emblazoned on the side of the van point the news some days later shows the same, or similar, van pictured, with the unfortunate woman who'd gotten, in having been wrapped multiple times, and then tossed out somewhere 50kms away from the destination mentioned. I don't think I really got a bad feeling that evening tbh, guess it's possible I just got lucky? I completely concede it could have been another van, glad I didn't get on either way point another instance of a genuine bad gut feeling experience was my mom yelling for me to come to the living room, I was making myself a snack in the kitchen. Maybe a second after, the 200 pounds water tank attached to the ceiling crashes down, flooding the entire apartment. I was maybe 7 at the time and would have been badly injured. When I was small, around 7 or 8, I went to a park. To celebrate my cousin's birthday point they had this giant balloon that people could walk in and out of, it's hard to describe as it was some sort of artistic design or something. Anyways, my other cousin was a few years older than I, and I decided we would go into the balloon and take a look around. Once in there my cousin wanted to play hide and seek and was running around the balloon, all of a sudden I had this overwhelming sense of dread and I wanted to leave the balloon as soon as possible. After asking my cousin to leave, he refused as he was enjoying himself too much. I was never one to leave my elders back then, and would normally have stayed with them, and just kept bugging them to leave, however the feeling I had was so strong I just said fine, I'll see you outside. Something that was way out of character for me. He gave in, and left with me. We walked over to an ice cream truck not very far away from the balloon, when we suddenly saw the whole thing raise up on one side. I found out by watching the news later on that there was something wrong with the pins holding it to the ground point honestly, if it wasn't for my sense of dread I honestly think my cousin and I would died. When the balloon collapsed to the ground again it fell and deflated with everyone inside, which I believe caused a few people to suffocate. I saw people lying on the ground that had passed away, who I had seen alive and well only a few minutes before. Side note, not sure if she also had a dread feeling, or if she was just getting annoyed by the sun, but my grandmother kept demanding my family move our tent and picnic stuff beyond two trees near the balloon. They gave in and moved it, if they hadn't they would have been camped exactly where the balloon would have fallen. It's scary to think that most of my family cold been gravely injured or killed all in one day, if it wasn't for total chance point tldr. Giant balloon almost killed my cousin and I, but my gut feeling made me leave in time to be safe. I'm going to tell a story without giving too much information about myself or any of the parties involved point in my old apartment building. I had a neighbor, we'll call her ex, living in the building next to mine, which was about a 1-2-2 two, two minute walk. She knew some of the people I knew who lived in my building and that's how we got to know each other. She was taking some classes and asked me to babysit her youngest kid as no Daker had a place for him. That's how our friendship started. At the beginning, we only exchanged pleasantries and a small chat here and there whenever she came to drop off slash pick up her son. However, over time we started getting closer. 
she would stay a little longer when she was supposed to pick her son up or call me to just chat or what have you. It turned into her inviting me over to her place to hang out and myself doing the same. She started opening up to me and telling me about her problems with her husband. She never said a bad thing about him, never thought that their problems were that serious, and I have never seen the man. The only thing I knew about him was his name, we'll call him Y. This went on for an entire year or so, during which X and I grew closer. She'd call me at 11pm crying, when they'd have a fight, or sometimes even come to my place crying, unannounced. At that point I'm thinking she's so desperately in love with him that it's making her overly sensitive slash insecure. Whenever they'd have a fight point one time, when she came to pick her son up, I had that urgent feeling to see the man. I knew that she'll be staying a little extra time because he was picking them up to take them for dinner after work slash her classes. So, when she was getting ready to leave my place, I insisted in helping her take the stroller down and say goodbye at the main door the door to the building is glass, allowing anyone from an or outside the building to be able to see through. I stayed in the building and said bye to her and that's when I saw her husband in the car. It was my first and only time ever seeing him, and I say seeing not meeting, because I saw him from afar and never interacted with him, and after literally 3 seconds, I looked to the person who was with me, I knew them, and said, word for word, this man is not okay. He's dangerous, and I would not be surprised if it turns out he is abusive, and I just had this sick feeling in my stomach that I actually had to step outside for fresh air after they drove off point fast forward a year after that day. The son I was babysitting was now going to daycare, but the mom and I still maintained a good friendship and still hung out. One time during one of our little hangouts, she tells me that Y is taking them to a trip to city within the country we live in for a week for a family vacation. Immediately, alarms are going off in my head like crazy. I'm having the same sick feeling in my stomach as when I saw his face behind that steering wheel a year prior. I'm a little confused as to why I'm having this feeling, because they have not been having any problems or fights that I'm aware of. I take a mental note of it and listen to her tell me what they are planning to do in that city and how excited she is a week goes by. She hasn't messaged or texted me at all during that week. I thought it was odd, but assumed she was busy with the trip and her family. After the week is up, I message her the day she was supposed to be back saying home sweet home. Can't wait to hear all about it, A eh? Few days go by, no response. I call, no response. Now I'm getting worried and thinking this is very very unlike her. So I'm like fuck it, and screw politeness I go to her apartment and announced, and knock on the door a few times. Again, no response. I go down, and ask the superintendent, if they have seen, or heard from her, and they say they have not heard from, or seen her in well over a week. I thank her, and walk away point a few months go by, during the time I was trying left, and right to contact her, and there was never a response. One day, all of a sudden, I receive a message on WhatsApp from an international number that is not saved on my phone. The message read hey. This is X I didn't know who else to reach out to. Y took me and the kids on a plane, pretending that we are going to city within the country we live in, but instead he took us to their home country, and this is my first time I was allowed out of the house. I'm now at my mum's place. I don't know when else I'd get access to the internet again, but I thought I'd let you know what I have been up to. Turns out this motherfucker kidnapped his wife and kids, flew them all back to their country of origin, and have been verbally, emotionally, and physically abusing all of them because he knew she was starting to hang out with me more and was having more freedom and more control over what she wants and doesn't want to do slash say and where to go point tldr. A man I saw once and didn't get the greatest vibes from kidnapped his wife and kids overseas. So he can be abusive towards them because they were getting too much freedom than what he likes. Saw a comment that reminded me of this. Might as well get a triple, all with the same prick. So about a year, maybe less, ago I was trying to make up with my boyfriend. LDR. I had just made another friend that was like a brother to me, also long distance. He was on a trip in Japan, so I was excited for him to come back and meet my boyfriend. He comes back and they get along. Great. 
they start hanging out more and eventually without me. It all took a head when we were playing dead by daylight and my boyfriend was healing my friend. Very sexual innuendos was made. Very obviously. They said it was a joke when I brought up about how uncomfortable it made me and basically belittled my feelings. Day or two later my boyfriend spoke to me and said that he had fallen in love with my friend and my friend just said nothing. I was pissed and hurt. I faking told you and dipped from the call. Called my other friend and basically was sobbing to him. He also got in a I knew it moment because he hated my now ex's guts and told me but I didn't listen. He deserved it because, again, wasn't my first rodeo with the dude point ended up forgiving my friend, sort of. Stupid I know. Stuck close to my friend while he was with my ex. Probably should point out that, although ex was poly with me and had another girlfriend, for our first relationship at least, he wasn't with my friend. Wasn't supposed to be at least. Spoke to other girlfriend about something that wasn't to the matter of ex or friend, but she brought up ex, and I had a sinking feeling that he never actually broke up with her. Asked her, and, yep, never did. Asked friend about her, and he said that he has met her, but had no idea about them being together. He thought they broke up, was told that they broke up. Ex cheated on him one last time before friend cut him off point barely talked to friend anymore, albeit still on good terms. Never really trusted him again after that. X is out of our lives this was all within at the least, a year. Kind of a stressful year. This will probably get buried, but here's mine point so back at my old house there was a bunch of woods that I'd walk around in a bunch when it wasn't stupidly hot. About half a mile back there was a small creek that had several signs saying, do not cross, when it was winter and everything was dead, and had very little leaves you could make out an outline of a small house another 300 yards back, if you knew what you were looking for to kind of paint the picture, you had half a mile of woods, about a 500 yard stretch of a very slight decline leading down to the creek. Then on the other side of the creek, which was about 30 ish feet across, there was a steeper incline that lead to what looked like a big clearing. That incline was about 300 yards from the creek to the clearing, and went from the elevation of the creek to about 15 to 20 ish feet above creek elevation point anyway. One day me, and four of my dumbest friends, two guys including myself and three girls, decided to go across it. We did, and after we got a few steps from the creek I got a horrible gut feeling. Everything about this place felt wrong. We kept walking up the incline before I told my friends that I felt something was off. Apparently I wasn't the only one who felt that, and we all decided to turn around and leave. Point turns out that house was some crazy guy's home. Two girls who went across the creek were imprisoned and basically used as such slaves for over a year before the guy was discovered. Point I don't know where those two girls are, I don't know where that guy is, but I hope those girls are doing okay, and I hope that guy died slowly and painfully. I've had a few, probably the one that stands out the most was a gut instinct that I didn't follow and got bit in the as as a result point I had gotten out of a pretty bad relationship, dated someone new briefly who I had high hopes for, and then that came crashing down too. So I had essentially gone from being the happiest that I'd ever been to that point, to the saddest I can recall, being in my life. Needless to say I was pretty desperate, and as many people do, I turned to such as a way to cope. I'd actually had a regular girl that I'd known years prior who I reconnected with, but frankly I was shallow, and I needed affirmation that I could pull more than just her. Q dating apps. I met one girl on a particular app who was a stripper. Now I don't think there's anything wrong with being a dancer, or a sex worker, born actress, whatever, but you gotta be really cautious with these things, and I was not. We hooked up a few times, and I was essentially a low budget sugar daddy, paying some of her bills and whatnot. We faked like 4 to 5 times, and then she kinda dropped off the radar I saw her again a few months later, and she had pics posted with her boyfriend, so that explained that. But stupidly I decided to reach out anyways and perhaps offer the same arrangement we had before, and she agreed. She told me to head over to her house, I'd been there before, and so I did. As I got closer though, I began to have a gut feeling all was not right. When I pulled up there was a car in the drive, and I knew she didn't have a vehicle. 
but I shrugged it off as probably a family member who had taken another car. As I walked to the door, I could hear some noise upstairs, more than what a small stature girl such as herself should make. I texted her here, and she took a bit to reply. What's crazy looking back now, I had left my wallet in the car, only carrying cash, and I realized subliminally I already knew it was a bad idea. I almost left when she unlocked the door and I went inside. Something didn't feel right. While she was a quiet girl, her vibe made it feel like she was almost reluctantly doing this. We went to one of the bedrooms, and she said she was gonna put her dog away. I said okay, so are you single now? She said no so I asked, does he know you do this? And she responded with a nervous laugh no. Moments after she walked out, I heard loud footsteps down the hall, and a black guy with a pistol rounded the corner and asked me where's the money? I of course gave it to him. And he went on about some you gonna pay for bussy again. Sheet. I of course said no, and he took my phone and kicked me out of the house. I drove to the nearest gas station and called the police. They arrived and arrested them both. The dumbest stayed at the scene. If he hadn't stolen my phone, then the case would have been a lot harder. To prosecute point listen to your gut instinct and don't be afraid to be rude and walk away when you know sheet ain't right. Cold cost me my life. This was actually pretty recently point this isn't so much as an I could have died if I didn't listen to my gut kind of thing, but my gut said something was up and I listened so here it is so. Our health teacher had some sort of internal attack when he was out for a jog and it was something to do with his nervous system in like the second or third month of the school year. Due to the fact we were overloading substitutes, already having four or five permanent substitutes, for those who don't know, a permanent substitute is one who remains in a class for the remainder of the year. In the school, the class was split Monday Wednesday with one perm sub and Thursday and Friday with another. We already know the one for Thursday and Friday, and she's chill some days and annoying others, but she typically leaves us to our own devices, literally. The Monday Wednesday we've only seen, when she was a substitute for two or three other teachers, all one to two days. So it was basically our official first time meeting point my gut said hey, underwater crab rave, don't piss this chick off, and for the most part one didn't, however it was a struggle most days, due to the fact I was typically the ringleader of literally any classroom disruption. Anyways, about a week goes by, and due to our teenage lives in the middle of nowhere, anything that happens an hour out of the school we latch onto like leeches anyways, a week goes by, and one story that stood out from the rest spread, and due to the fact a classroom of 30 people who never even talk to each other, unless forced to have the same story, I believe it. The substitute, let's call her P.S., had a makeshift recycling bin slash bag. Apparently it was the material of a bag, but was sturdy enough to be in the relative shape of a classroom bin, and flat out hit a student with it. Due to the class being health, we were learning about healthy eating and all that, so all the classes were watching this video. At the end, the guy said something like eat food. Not too much. Mostly plants. And she drilled that into us like our lives would end, if we didn't memorize it. So, two days after we finish it, PS asked the class what the three sentences were, and this kid forgets to raise his hand, and just blurts them out, so she deems his punishment is a verbal lecture, and then whacking him with the bag slash bin point we also found out, thanks to her amazing ability, to not keep a secret, that she has already had her teaching license revoked by the state, and administration knows it, but refuses to take action. Other incidents include P.S. getting very physically close with my friend, where she'd get face to face, their noses an inch, if not less from each other, and just say to her I swear back in high school there was this girl that looked exactly like you and it almost sounded seductive in a way. Note P.S. has already retired, though it is a common belief she was forced to quietly resign, and is 72 years old point I know it's not really or I could have died. Had I not listened to my gut kind of story, but something was most definitely wrong point edit, minor grammatical error fixes. Posted this before but here goes, witnessed and stopped a gang rap 10 years ago, it still haunts me to think about it point edit, full story below point, so I was at a house party, when I was about 20, we were drinking all day. I was fairly drunk, and decided with two of my friends to head home, after getting some food. 
we walked from a garage through a shortcut through a housing estate. As we got in I seen a group of lads hanging around a tree about 200 feet ahead of me. One of the guys looked over at us and started walking towards us. We stayed on the path which went well around the trees where they were. The guy approached us and asked for a smoke. He barely spoke English. He laughed when we said no and continued to walk with us around the path, which was strange point eventually he walked back to the group and we continued walking on the path. My two mates are kind of rough and have a bit of a reputation for trouble in the past. As we were walking one of my mates said, that girl has no trousers on. Thinking it was a joke we said ah, it's probably just some tan pants we hadn't noticed her at all at first. The lads were all watching us which was really strange and the girl started stumbling away. I didn't know what was happening, but thought my mates just wanted to start a fight, so I kept dragging them with me. We got to a row of houses and the girl was about 300 feet from us at that stage. The lads started walking towards her. When they thought we were out of sight point we stopped at the corner to see what was happening, but we're out of sight of them. I heard her screaming, and at that point, knew something bad was definitely happening. I looked at my mates one of them had a knife and the other a brick. All I could think was if I don't get involved here, they will and I could go to prison. I never sobered up so quickly, we all ran around the corner at them, and they took off running. The girl was bent over stuck in a bush, so I told my mate with the knife to stay with her. We took off after them, and they ran into a house around the corner, when we got around the corner we couldn't say exactly which house it was. We lost them, but we had a description. We went back around to the girl, and tried to calm her down point I called the police and they asked where I was. I didn't know, so I just gave them vague directions towards the garage we were at earlier, and within minutes I was able to flag them down. I then explained what happened, and the policeman asked me to show them where it happened. I walked him over to the trees, while my mates gave statements. When we got to the trees one of the guys that wrapped her were asleep against the tree. The policeman hit him such a kick and threw him into the car. We found her bag, but it was empty point at this point the police told us to go home and would be in contact. I walked home with my mates we got home about 30 minutes later. I called my father who was a detective at the time and told him to get up out of bed I had something to tell him. I got home about half 5 and stayed up telling him the story until about 6. Went up to bed, and the police were at my door at 8. I went to the station, gave my statement, and told them where they ran off to. The girl was wrapped a few times before we got there but something worse could have happened. If we had not been there point they ended up catching the guys from the statements we gave. They found her phone and purse in the house and they were also giving alcohol to kids on the road earlier that day. All Lithuanian and they faked off home before they could be brought to court. Point sorry for the wall of text. Let me know if you have any more questions. All of these stories have a common thread. Wit. Dangerous. Perverted person viewed as an isolated incident deserving of judgment. From the mass murderers to your average day but off aisle, it usually starts with a conflict of interest. For instance my gratification over higher priorities, then a break in the psyche. For instance I'm very drunk, oppression from the influence. For instance I got nothing but this, acceptance. For instance just this once, and then habituation, and then again and again. That being said, humans are nothing without an interactive response from the environment, an opportunity to reject deny or accept something. Guess who provides those opportunities to rapists and bidophiles? Captain Howdy. Captain Howdy's goal is simple. Get her done. Away from the competitor and into his brothel, his hell, under his control, forever. It's mostly a pride thing, and it's driven by the fact that Captain Howdy is a forever outcast. That oh no he has no logical argument to present before the superiors of life. So how do normal humans like us conquer Captain Howdy and his fallen zombies? I'll cut to a story I heard. This one lady was really broke. Her and her husband started a business that was struggling to get going. So they sold their house and moved into an eerie looking house high up on a hill. The house gave her the full dose of creeps, but it was rent free so her and her family decided to put up with the whole weird vibe thing. Things took a turn for the worse as the days went by, but she found the inner strength and wisdom to not let up. Every time she felt a weird creep in her spine, she would fill her mind with an even stronger plea. A plea that shed light on her soul. There was no room in her for vacuous victimization. 
Captain Hardy saw that she and her whole family were like angels. Suddenly, the cords of darkness lifted and things started going very well for her. She was able to rebuild that house from scratch and her whole family still lives there to this day. Point another story. Missionary goes to Japan. She feels a weird oppression. Her head starts to hurt, her body weakening, even before she steps off the plane. She asks for healing in her prayer and realizes that the place she was staying at was an old temple for ancient gods. The spirits there were oppressing her to make her leave because this was their territory. She stayed and endured. She got better and was able to continue with her ministry point personally. I get weird uncomfortable vibes when there's genuine conflict of interest. Not like I want your hamburger, there's only one hamburger. The kind that demons and angels fight over. Personal fulfillment through hierarchical power of destruction or construction. There are people who are genuinely suffering, like a homeless lady on the streets, whom I feel more kinship with over some colleagues. Be kind. For everyone is going through an epic battle, especially the ones who Captain Howdy thinks is a threat. In the past, I would get scared and anxious just being around conflicts of interest. Now I just see them as run-of-the-mill Captain Howdy victims and disconnects. It's just the cost of living in a world this ambiguously dangerous. That being said, God, the master of this universe, is genuinely good. Magnificent, even. God's signature outlines all bracketed kerfuffles. If we learn the rules of the road and learn how to think bigger than our enemy, we will survive. We won't condemn or judge. We'll have the legitimate power to understand the nature of the problem, learn how to heal and reconstruct all those weak and broken lives. I bet the code can be reassembled, Lord. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven. Eleven thrown into the fire of hell point it is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell point you. Twenty wanna stop your nonsense I throw four back. I got on my bus after work to head home and went to the top deck where I found a seat easily. There were maybe five seats taken. The rest was pretty empty two stops later this guy gets on, heads up the stairs and immediately spots me and sits next to me. I think it's a bit odd as there were plenty of seats free. He's staring at me the whole time and as I was in a window seat, I couldn't get up to switch. He's still staring and starts pressing his thigh against mine. At that point I decide maybe I should just get off the bus, he's making me uncomfortable. I was hoping he wouldn't follow me, but as soon as I stand up, he hops up too and follows me down the stairs. I'm standing by the exit and he's standing nearby and I get my keys out and do that thing that we do when we are feeling vulnerable and I think at that point he clocks that I'm concerned by his behavior. So he heads to the driver box and asks the driver for directions. As soon as the bus stops, I launch myself out the exit and run in the opposite direction so I don't pass the driver's end of the bus where he was and I keep going until I get home, not looking back once. I was training for a marathon at the time so this was easy for me point I didn't really think much of it, I'm naturally paranoid and thought maybe I was overreacting. A few weeks later there was a such attack in broad daylight of a guy who followed a young woman off a bus and attacked her in broad daylight along the same bus route I used that day. There was CCTV footage on the local news and it was the same guy. The guy targeted females wearing big headphones. When the guy got on the bus and made a beeline for me, I was wearing a big set of headphones which I took off. When he started staring point I did file a police report after it happened and before the such attack on the young woman happened, but they said it was circumstantial as he didn't actually do anything to me. Not me but my mom. Back when I was about 8 or 9, my aunt was living in an apartment with her husband and baby daughter. My mother claims to have some kind of sixth sense for when something is seriously wrong with our family and it hasn't been wrong yet to my knowledge point I was at home with my mom when she had grabbed me and all but ran out of our house. She drove us straight to my aunt's apartment building and started trying to bang on the door once we were inside. We could hear my cousin, the baby daughter, crying from inside. She had handed me her phone and told me to call my aunt when she didn't answer the door. She never answered. At some point she had taken her phone back from me and called the police saying she thought my aunt may have overdosed and that she could hear my cousin crying in the apartment. 
My aunt and her husband both have a history of abusing prescription drugs, and she has been hospitalized for overdosing on multiple occasions. When the police arrived and the door was opened my cousin was found strapped into a baby carrier in the living room. Aunt and husband nowhere to be found. She had apparently been in that carrier for multiple hours. Possibly over a day with how soiled she'd been point my aunt was located a few hours later in a hospital a few hours away. She had in fact overdosed while partying with her husband and some of his friends and they'd taken her there, left her, and not bothered to tell anyone point so yeah. My mother's gut feelings are almost always correct, and I've learned that when she says something's wrong, then something's wrong point said cousin was later kidnapped by her father after she'd been put into my grandmother's custody, but they were found within a couple days. I am so late, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. We were playing poker inside the campus with chips, and gambling is a very serious offense, and when caught you will be expelled. Being a bunch of dumb as high school kids, we did it every Tuesday and Thursday in our classroom, because most teachers don't check senior high school classrooms, because they think we are responsible. So we were playing poker, and I was winning a lot of money, and I had a gut feeling that today might be the day that a teacher might catch us. I tried to quit the game, but my classmates won't let me because they want to win their money back. I always trust my instincts, no matter how ridiculous, so I purposely threw the game and lost all my money. After losing a sat behind and played on my phone and waited for a teacher to finally catch us two minutes after stood up, I heard a load banging from the door. We all ignored it because it might be our friends trying to scare us, but when I looked at the window on the door it was my science teacher. I opened the door and tried to tell her that I was just watching. Turns out that that day was the yearly inspection for all of the classrooms. The teacher talked to us and gave us a choice, A, report us to the grade level coordinator B, the disciplinary officer, or C, our advisor. All of the options were equivalent to instant expulsion and the teacher thought that we might go for option C, our advisor is as strict as our disciplinary officer. As she was telling us this, I had a feeling that I'd just tell her to forget about all of this, I had ran out of options and hope. So I told her Miss Teacher what, if you forgive us, and we all just forget about this, and we will never do this again. She replied okay, but meet me on Tuesday and we will think about another punishment. Then Tuesday comes, and the teacher did not show up. So I stopped playing poker. This happened a long time ago and this is the first time I have talked about this incident not my gut feeling, but my cousins a long time ago. When I was young my mom took my older sister her boyfriend, my cousin and I to a empty church parking lot to practice driving. It was really fun, and when my cousin's turn came around the car was parked. Before he started the car I guess he had a bad feeling, so he started to pray. We aren't a religious family. As he finished we heard a car speeding down the road. The car passed the parking lot then we heard it swerve around. It very quickly then pulled into the parking lot and stopped right next to us. The driver rolled down his tinted window, he was in a black van with very tinted windows, so we couldn't see inside, he started yelling at us to get out of the car or he'd kill us, everyone did as he asked, except for my sister who was in crutches at the time, my cousin got out, and ran towards a neighborhood nearby, and called the cops, the driver drove after him, but got pulled over for speeding, he was also arrested point turns out he was drunk. He had a bat in his car, which thank god he didn't have a gun. He also had a dog and his ex in his car. She was bruised from him beating her, and she was stuck with him. Point this makes me wonder, if he didn't stop to threaten us what else would he have done to her? If my cousin was driving, would he have hit us? If we didn't pray, would we have died? This had strengthened my belief in god by a lot. This whole story takes place over two weeks. It was my freshman year summer and previously we had moved from a spot in the town to the middle of nowhere, and I loved it. The closest police station was a sheriff's department a hour and a half away so there was a local militia for lack of a better term, and the area I was in was focused on self-defense, and I was familiar with guns, but I really stepped up my abilities to a point where I could do well at a shooting competition. I was in all about firearm safety and I cleaned and checked my equipment regularly. Okay that's the backstory you'd need. 
It all started when I get home from a hike with my dog, the world's cutest pit bull, and I knew my dog pretty well so when she started acting weird I noticed immediately. She was usually aggressive to animals but anything bigger than a man she would be more curious in. I noticed her standing on top of the stairs with on near up, so I figured it was a mouse or something in the basement, but it felt weird, like she was watching and not listening I was uneasy when she turned her head. So I grabbed a knife and walked over to the dog, looked down and nothing, so I turned on the light and again nothing, I shrugged it off, but it didn't stop sometimes it was like she was on guard and others, like she was just listening. I also realized doors weren't how I left them food was missing and someone was feeding my dog, but I'm forgetful, and I live with my dad so whatever I'm just uneasy this continued from Tuesday to Friday that day my dad left town, and it was just me and my pup for a few days. So I decided to clean my guns and this is when my uneasy went to dread. When I got out all my favorite firearms I realized half were chambered and all magazines were full. I clean and I hunt, but every time I put them back I ensure they aren't chambered and the clips in the gun are missing three bullets. It's how I make sure my family isn't in my stuff. When I opened my rifle and shotgun they had been fired. I hadn't shot them in 6 months and I'd cleaned both a dozen times since. I know it wasn't my dad. He only uses what he used in the service. This had me tripping, so I went to a friend's house and the feeling followed me. I stayed with him for a while, but that week I was watching my little cousin. She was 7 or 8 and the love of my life I adored her, my favorite person on earth. But I had this uneasiness that even she couldn't cure. I had her sleep in my bed and I took the floor saying it was a sleepover. I wouldn't leave her side and I always had a pistol in the back of my shirt. We got four days in and some strange stuff happened. That week like when we went to bed I woke up with the door open. But my dog's still at the foot of the bed which is odd she sleeps on the ground floor usually not the second that morning I locked the basement door. Because I got tired of the dog doing that thing when she wasn't with Ryan. The next day I was making lunch for I and my cousin, when I heard the house settle I had heard it before, but this time it was different, and I hated it, and the dread tuned to a realization there were three people in the house, I set the table for three not two, and pushed in the chairs, before I put the food on the table then I went to get Ryan, and saw the basement door cracked, but I didn't break stride I picked Ryan up which frightened her and put her in the truck put my pup in the bed and drove to pap's house I told him to get the posse, five of our militia, and went to the house, I had us park half a mile away. We had a guy watch the front and we came in the basement, when I saw the a single glass of water that's all the proof I needed to set pap's working dogs loose I shouted Krieg, 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 which is German for war and our attack command for the German shepherds, they charge in, and we start clearing the basement, when I hear a gunshot and screaming. We run to the kitchen where a 6 to 160 lanky individual was eating my lunch. I grabbed my gun which he'd taken and then pulled the dogs off him and he tries to fight me with a knife. Pap shot him in the leg and we hold him until a sheriff arrives. When the cop is taking him away to the hospital he says tell Ryan I said bye and my dread turned to rage. Later we found out he'd done time for manslaughter that couldn't prove intent and warrants for other violent crimes. I often wonder if I should have known sooner and what if anything would have happened if I didn't. But what really haunts me to today is the danger I put my little cousin in while her parents were away. I had a ominous feeling this one time when I used to live in a rural town when I was 9. We had moved there because of a mining boom. To give some more context the suburb was built so quickly and was so new the nearest police station was the next town over about 30 kilometers which isn't too bad, but this one police station had to protect the three towns around it, so the police were spread thin. Anyways it fueled this really big problem with bidophiles and here's why I need this context, the local high school had a bidophile gang point yes you are in fact hearing this right. The only identified person in it was the leader, Jed as he had been in jail twice, so he was known around town, and I'm sure he had been put on a register, but there was around about a dozen of them point anyways one day me, and my younger friend of 7 years old Jay decided we'd go to the park together as it was only on the same street as our houses 20 meters down the road. We were the only ones there for some strange reason, 
So we soon got bored of the equipment and my friend wanted to go play in the small bush maze there, because it had overgrown making it much more appealing so I agreed, and we headed over soon as we got next to it, I felt like you would before or fight. Something like that just I knew there had to be something wrong, so I said to my friend, hey but what, if Jed is in there, there's no one else here it's not safe then he questioned well how, do we know, if he's in there then my stupid 9 year olders thought. Hey Jay let's throw rocks in there, we have our bikes, if Jed's in there he'll come out, and we can ride away we spent the next 10 minutes hurling rocks into this bush, as big rocks as we could to no avail my friend then pondered hey he must not be in there, or he would have came out and probably killed us I said yeah, but I don't feel like going in there still. Something is wrong my friend agreed, but said he wanted to check as he'd never been in it. I stood back as he approached, but as he did Jed stood up slowly, and we just froze in shock and fear as walked towards us yelling, you little faking cunt, do you know how close that came to my head I'm gonna make you pay so bad then he grabbed my friend a smile this god awful smile, while his crew started walking out, but as he was being angry and dramatic I had sidestepped over to my bike, and was now on it beginning to pedal. Jed notices me doing this, yells, where do you think you're going you stupid faking rat sheet as he began to run towards me, as he did this, I just got the biggest adrenaline spike and managed to make enough speed to outrun him, thank you smokes for giving him short breath, thank you dad for not getting me a BMX like the other kids, and getting me a very practical mountain bike, he then yelled again fack. Then went on about how he didn't need me, and didn't care about catching me as I was worthless. I felt very relieved to be away, and started to feel safe, but then I thought he is coming for me, probably even though he doesn't have a big enough bike, so picked up speed again, and kept going towards home. As I turned, left onto my street I turned around, to see him chasing me on his own bike catching up to me which made me panic as my driveway was steep he'd be able to catch me going up it, but luckily I was lucky as fact to have my mother standing on the top of the driveway as just my bike tire touched it, I yelled for my mother and Jed just zoomed past staring at me with just so much anger, disappointment, and hate. Man that face, if looks could kill. I told her what had just happened in a panic as we watched Jed zoom down the street, and she said to go tell my friend's parents what had happened to him as he lived directly across the street and my mum went in to tell my dad as well as call the cops I ran over out of breath and freaking out, and his dad answered the door I managed to get out that Jed has kidnapped Jay, and he was in the bush in the park. He just boiled up with anger spontaneously then bellowed what you're faking joking me. I thought he was gonna kill me, but then he pushes past me just saying what the fuck, and how he's gonna rend this once and for all he then proceeds to get in his literal 2 day old 60 grand brand new sports car, he bragged about it, and I just watch him in bewilderment speed down the street, do a 50 degree skid for effect as he pulls the car over in front of this house. About 8 doors down. I honestly thought he was gonna go down there or beat the crap out at all of them, but kicks open this house's door, he was a big guy, and starts yelling sheet. I was told later, that he was threatening Jed's dad that, if he didn't get his son, to let his son out of the bush right then his son was going back to jail for life, pretty much Jed's dad starts crying, and sheet on his knees begging him. The noise of the tires screeching had caused all but one of Jed's lackers even Jed himself to go out and see if it was the police or just legged as I had escaped, and they were confused as to how the police had responded so quickly as well as nervous about me getting away. The last guy there was either trying to cover his ass or as Jay described it the guy was pretending to be like them to save kids when he could, and never touched, or did anything to Jay in the bush, or said anything mean even, I obviously won't describe what the other men did. Well this guy had let Jay go, when they went out, to investigate the tire screech and told him to run, so I see Jay stumble up the road with his jacket over his shoulders just bawling his eyes he was so faking distraught, in fact I'd never seen someone so upset at that point in my life, but it was one of the best feelings I've felt seeing him. I just forgot about all danger, and ran to him, and escorted him home, I tried talking to him asking if he was okay, but he couldn't speak for sheet. I just ushered him home to his mum, and stayed inside point I can't remember much else, but, I remember that Jed wasn't seen at any park for a long time nor that town. Hell he wasn't even spoken of a month after that, I assume he went back, to jail for a long time. Jay made a full recovery too, resilient kid.
but I'll never forget that day, it's just still so clear I think maybe because of the adrenaline. No regrets though that's for sure point TLDR. I had a weird feeling slash epiphany that lead me to throw rocks at a bush to flush out danger. Bush contained Bido gang whom grabbed my friend. Rock throwing enraged Bido gang. Anger blinded them I got away. I then saved my friend by telling his dad. Anti Bido spy in the gang. Let my friend go free with the opening his dad caused by coincidence. Happy end feel free to ask any questions. FYI Jed is his real name to my knowledge second obviously don't care about keeping that come stain anonymous. TLDR. Creepy car stopped me on a rural road. I would've helped if my dog hadn't gone crazy. Sheriff told me to go home the next day and that they'd been looking for this description of men for a while point to set the scene. I was driving through rural East River South Dakota from a more populated town to a town of about 200. It was mid-February, so the sun was down, even though it was only about 7 p.m. The road I had to take winds through a lot of hills because it's near a river. And during this particular time of year there tends to be a lot of flooding and ice due to the constant melting and refreezing of snow that would ice over the storm drains. So despite this being a heavily traveled road during the summer, it was dead this time of year because a lot of the offline gravel roads people lived off were closed and people had to take a more main highway. I took this road multiple times every week and knew where to look out for flooding, but I never tried to take this road this late at night. So I was driving a little slower, probably 55 to 60, when the posted speed limit is 65. I drive a newer Audi with 4WD, so I knew if I paid attention I should be okay and adjusted my speed to the low 40s around the banking curves. With no one around it wasn't an issue. So, what happened was I was coming out of one of these curves and I see a newer silver Chevy Travis. I still remember the license plate cause this sheet was creepy, but I won't post it on the side of the road with its hazards on. And as I approach I see someone run out from the back of the car into the middle of the road waving his arms. I slammed on my brakes and luckily the pavement was dry. I came to a halt probably 25 feet from this guy. Now, what they say about Midwesterners is true. If it was any other circumstance I would cracked a window and asked if the guy was okay. But this time was different. I have a 4 year old border collie and he loves everybody. But for some reason he got really defensive and ridged and just started barking and growling with his ears back and teeth showing. Something I've never seen him do. So I just stared at the guy, made sure my doors were locked, and creeped forward to go around him. When he saw me moving he jumped in his car and the light came on and I saw another man in the car. They were both wearing black hoodies. Creepy. But it was cold. So whatever. I took off, and they started speeding after me, ended up passing me really close to my driver's side, almost like they were trying to run me off the road. I slowed way down, texted the friend I was going to meet, scared, creepy car. He texted me back, but I didn't read it, I don't like to text and drive. The Chevy used crossroads to turn around and head back towards me. I started to speed at this point, probably 75 over 80. I was scared. That's when I saw them turn around behind me and haul absolutus back up behind me. I texted my friend quick again coming in hot. Be outside. I called the police next and told them what was going on. They told me to get where I was going and lock the door. I lost them about 3 miles out of town when I decided to dip down a gravel road and take a back way into town past a bunch of farms I knew the residents of if I, they continued to follow me, and I think they decided it wasn't worth it. Eventually sheriffs showed up at the door. And I got virtually no information out of them, but they had a US marshal with them, which is weird I think, and basically all I got was stay inside tonight and go home tomorrow during the day, I was from about 1.5 hours north, and we've been looking for guys that match this description for a while. I creeped the news for a while, but never saw anything about it, and in an area this boring, that's weird point I would've said something to them, if my dog hadn't gone crazy. Nicely done Bailey. My dad worked as a GM for a hotel. He had a real character of a janitor working for him named John. John always made a point of showing up on time, doing everything that was required of him and more, and even going out of his way 
to help other people with their work where he could. Just genuinely liked his job. We even got invited to his house sometimes for get togethers, along with some of the other hotel employees. Everybody liked the guy. He was sort of like the unofficial mascot of the hotel, because even guests asked about him sometimes. Anyways, John had been working for two years at the hotel when one day, my dad happens to pass by him in the hall, and notices that he has this long thousand yard stare. He has this look on his face like his brain has been transported to another dimension, where everything is horrible. Dad's words, not mine. Dad asks him if everything is alright, which brings him back to reality. He just slowly turns to my dad and says, completely seriously, I need to go home. Dad asks what's wrong, and John tells him that he doesn't know, but he got a really bad feeling as he left the house this morning, and it's only gotten worse. Knowing he's not the kind of guy to pull a stunt to get out of work, dad lets him leave early for the day and gets someone else to cover for him. Point John comes back into work the next day, visibly crushed. Dad asks him what happened. Turns out by coming home early, he caught his wife literally in bed with another man. Dad's empathetic and eventually asks who it was. John shakes his head. Dad presses him and John says he doesn't want to say because it was someone who works here. Dad never found out who it was, but he spent the rest of that day taking a long, hard look at his other male employees, wondering how well he really knew them. 4th of July, 2016 I had just gotten back from a 10 day trip to Mexico with some friends. As you typically would, we drank a lot at the all inclusive resort we stayed at. When we came back, we went to Coney Island, New York, to watch the fireworks for the 4th. We all decided to get a few more drinks than usual, figuring our tolerances were higher having drank for 10 days on vacation, and we didn't wanna waste our money if we weren't gonna have a good time. The whole time I just have a feeling of dread hovering over me. At first I thought it was cause I spent a lot of money on all our drinks and just had buyer's regret, and since they made our drinks with sheety alcohol, it would make us sick. But as the night went on, and we got more intoxicated, responsibly, I might add. We weren't getting sheet faced I still felt the feeling getting worse, which was strange, since I usually cheer up with a few drinks. Fast forward to after the fireworks and everyone's walking to their cars slash subway slash apartments. We all collectively have a sweet tooth, so we stop at the massive candy store on Surf Avenue. Anyone from South Brooklyn knows this store lol. As I'm waiting in line with my novelty sized nerds rope, the feeling of dread kicks up to 11, and I kinda panic and just want to drop my candy and leave. I'm absolutely certain that something bad is gonna happen. With the current climate, I always tended to avoid large crowds in popular areas, especially staying around too long. There's a couple standing in front of me in line, not even arm's length in front. The guy's dreads are touching my chest, that's how close. Out of nowhere, a shiny, silver Ruja. 22 pistol comes over my shoulder, aimed at the back of the guy's head in front of me. Whoever rested their arm on my shoulder, to aim their gun shot the guy in the back of the head and took off. He dropped faster than people do in Family Guy, I was dumbfounded. Everyone scattered, including us, and I never got a look at the guy who did it. We just booked it to our friend's apartment up the block now instantly 100% sober, having witnessed an execution, not just in front of our eyes, but literally between the victim and the killer. I don't wanna say I felt relieved, but that feeling of dread I had all night that something bad was gonna happen here was finally lifted, as if it was never there, as if I got my closure point I'm sure it's archived in the news somewhere, but if I remember correctly they caught the guy the next day. I've seen a few deaths in my lifetime, even untimely ones, car accidents, pedestrians, and even a shooting victim bleed out on the corner, but nothing stands out more than literally standing in the middle of an execution, 